everybody. Welcome to Roundtable Live. My name is Bear Tavi, joined by Mathis Games, Rockley Smile, and Northern Line. Hello. Hello. Live. Yeah. Hello. 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 We're back. Konnichiwa. We're back. <laughs> Roundtable oh. is here. And, uh, oh, man, well, look at you alluding to things. He was gone for a little while. How was Japan, Northern Lion? Uh, I don't know how to say it's good in Japanese, so I will just say it was good. I'm happy to be back and relatively not jet lagged anymore, which is exciting. That is exciting. It's pronounced Mew Mew. How much anime Mew, did you see? Mew Mew. Uh, I saw like zero anime. And you but... didn't experience Japan. Well, we were in the anime district for a while, but when Kate's shopping for anime and manga stuff, I'm just like on my phone tweeting shit posts. So, <laughs> like, <laughs> I heard anime is not real anyway. I can confirm that. I've I've been to the source, and it's it's a fiction. Give us like your your top two experiences. I won't even make you detail it too much. Top two experiences in Japan, man. Okay, um, like being at. Shibuya Crossing, which is just like an enormous, like 300,000 people cross it every time the lights change, sort of district in Japan was like otherworldly. And, um, well, we did like Tokyo Sky Tree last year, which is the tallest freestanding structure in the world. But this year we did Tokyo. Oh, God, I lost everybody. Oh, no. Ow. Whoa. Uh Holy nice crap. Well, I just, I just lost hello, you guys hello? for like a solid 10 <laughs> seconds. What is happening? Wow, yeah, you were gone. Oh, oh, holy uh, shit. What happened? Oh, this is a disaster. <laughs> yeah, that was... Who's running the call right now? Uh, I think it's... Uh, it might be Nick. I, I called. It might be me. Um, well... That was weird. Okay, I, I, we can maybe play off of that anyway. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's talk about our docket for today. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about on the show today. Of course, a few things that we uh, missed out on last week as well. Notably, the uh, GDC and IGF awards. Those were given out at GDC, which of course concluded last week. So we're going to touch on those. We also got the issue of PS4 and Xbox One crossplay, which is finally really starting to become a conversation that might lead to good things for all gamers. Uh, Rocket League, in particular, at the forefront of that. Shockingly enough, again, Rocket League back in the news. Uh, we're Speaking talk- of which, hey, Bear Tavi, I yeah. saw you fucking reinstalled it. Don't don't talk about that with me hey, right this now. This guy, hey, yo, I think I'm done with Rocket League. I uninstalled it. I'm playing Isaac. Bear Tavi just signs in to play Rocket League. I, I see just, how it is. Look, I, I, I made a mistake. I, I'm crawling back, defeated, and I, it, it, it sates this... It's like this cruel Neanderthalic need in me, right? Because I tweeted about this, uh, I think it was yesterday. It was like, let me just, let me hop onto this game for five minutes and just completely destroy any sense of self-confidence I had in myself before I started. <laughs> and I need that. I Whatever, the, well, there's no. that driving force in my brain that tells me, you know what? You got to get on there and let strangers on the internet put you back in your place. So I, I did it. And I, oh, I'm proud back. of myself. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, we're going to talk more about VR, because VR is the wave of the future. PlayStation VR has been confirmed. Uh, $400 launch price. Thank you, Kate, for subbing to the channel. And uh, $500 for the bundle as well. We can talk a little bit more about that, as well as virtual desktop, which is a nice correlating story there, too. Firewatch has sold half a million copies. Going to touch a little bit more there, as well as touch a little bit more. That's good phrasing. Ark Survival of the Fittest has also come around. It coincides well with our uh, Battle Royale genre conversation from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Also going to be looking at XCOM 2's ending missions. We will very clearly outline that we will be spoiling a little bit of uh, XCOM 2's ending. And by a little bit, I'm probably going to guess that it's going to be a lot of it, right? I don't think think we're going to talk story. I think we're just going to talk the final mission. Um, But that's other than that. Mm Mm-hmm. Right on. Uh, then we've got a couple of games as well. Shellshock Live, Deadbolt, going to be on the, uh, the docket for the finale of it. Uh, but to start off with, we're going to talk about the Independent Games Festival and the Game Developers Conference issued their uh, awards for this year's shows. Uh, if I can pull up this goddamn web page, I don't think the entire internet is really on my side today. Uh, of course, this entire conference mostly centered around game developers and the, uh, well, just really the culture there, I suppose. Uh, and it, I, well, personally, I consider this to be one of the more significant award shows in gaming. Uh, not to discredit uh, Jeff Keighley's efforts with the Game Awards or anything like that, but I, I feel like this is the, you know, like, by the people, for the people sort of argument 
in gaming. The, these are the people that, you know, the, they know the stuff, they know the trade, and they they are the ones that I, I feel are probably most qualified to issue out awards like this. Am I? Yeah, I feel like, um, like in a way, the that Game Awards stuff, or the Game Awards, is kind of like the, the Teen Choice Awards. <laughs> the <laughs> People's don't... Choice Awards. The people's, okay, right. yeah, okay. The People's Choice Awards. Which, you know, there needs to be a place for. Like, if you have audience voting in your in your polls, that makes sense. Although I think there is an audience poll for the GDC awards there anyway. Is, yeah. mm -hmm. But then the IGF awards are like the Sundance Film Festival. Yeah. It's like it's a little bit more critic focused, a little hipsterish, you could say, or pretentious if you wanted to be on the negative side. And then the GDC awards are maybe like the Oscars, or the the Game Developers Awards are maybe like You're the Oscars. You're saying the teens, the teens have no voice in this. Then the teens have no opinions on indie games. I I think in a way, <laughs> not fair. They, <laughs> <laughs> the teens vote with their wallets, man. That's right. All right. They bought Firewatch. Hopefully. Hopefully, I, I, a lot of people did, which is really <laughs> encouraging, man. Like I'm really excited to note on that again, but. Uh, let's talk about the, the actual nominees and the winners and all the different categories here as well. This is always a fun game when we have award shows to talk about, too, because we get to, uh, for the most part, at least play a little bit of a guessing game here. So let's start with uh, some of the not, the, not the simpler stuff, but just not the bigger awards here. We're looking at excellence in design here. And uh, keep in mind, this is going to be mostly indie games, if not all indie games, considering the uh, nature of the festival here. This is the Independent Games Festival is what we're talking about. Uh, so for Excellence in Design, we had six nominees. Her Story, Infinifactory, Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, Kingdom, Mini Metro, and Super Hot. So where were they leaning there? We're gonna, we'll just uh, we'll open it up wait, to discussion, this, but also maybe... Uh, is, keep is talking and nobody talking. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is this IGF or is this GDC? This is IGF. This is IGF. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say because I, I read the spoilers, so mm -hmm. I know that... One game won like a hundred of these. Yeah. So, oh, really? Uh, I think her, that it's was a her story probably one of them. It's pretty weighted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so we want to. I I would say that it will perhaps be a a human story about a woman who's got an ambiguous amount of guilt regarding a potential crime, perhaps <laughs> developed by Sam Barlow. Perhaps, maybe. Actually, it ended up being a uh, keep talking and nobody explodes this oh, time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. I'm happy about that. Uh, Excellence me, in design for Steel Crate Games. I I agree with this. I think this is a, a pretty too. solid innovation as far as games go these days. It's a great game. A game that takes pretty good advantage of VR. Not necessarily, you know, like... Uh, well, of course, it's not necessary to play the game because you can play it without VR quite fine. Uh, but I, I really like the direction they took with <clears throat> virtual reality in this one. It's, just, it's something that's a, a really good flavor enhancer for the game, yeah. right? But it's not something that is going to like ruin your experience if you can't have it, too. I quite like that they've already sort of subverted what we can expect from VR uh, yeah, by exactly, exactly. having it just used as a blinder, essentially, which is it's clever. It's a bit ahead of its time, so mm -hmm. good for them. I agree. I also think that like the nominees are pretty good. Yeah. Like I saw some people say that um, people are like, why is Mini Metro getting nominated for all this stuff? Yo, Mini Metro is like really good. <laughs> Don't just like look at it and, and assume that it's like some cheap, shitty iOS puzzler or something like that. Like that game is actually everybody who tweets about it is like it kind of looked like I didn't know what I was doing. But then when I got into it, it was awesome. And I spent like 10 hours playing it and it was really meditative. That game is good. There, I mean, we said this quite a few times. 2015 really was just a landmark year for games. It was huge. There were so many amazing games that came out in 2015. I mean, like, this yeah. nominee list alone is pretty hefty evidence of that. Just in the excellence in design category, like we just described, there's six games there that are fantastic. Like, those are all great games. So, uh, just a testament to 2015, again, with how, how much talent is really being exuded in every single category here. Uh, let's go to, this is probably maybe a little more of a subjective one, but it is interesting. Uh, excellent in visual art. We had Armello, Darkest Dungeon, G-Nog, which is not a game I think I'm familiar with. Oh, you haven't played G-Nog? I haven't played G-Nog. Have you played G-Nog? It's, <laughs> it's the Christmas Gatorade game. <laughs> that come out after or before Rust of 5G? Uh, <laughs> Rust of 5G. is a direct sequel, isn't it? Best game with a G acronym. Rust of 5G, G-Mod... G nog, nog. <laughs> nid hog. Uh, that doesn't that's, quite work. Yeah, you can make it a suffix, I guess, right? 
Uh, you got Gene Aga on there, Mini Metro again, Oxen Free, and Panoramical. Did anybody play Panoramical or check it out in any I have degree? To check because I, don't I felt remember. like Nick would probably have played it. I don't think it, I but... did. So Panoramical is more of, of like a, it's more of like a, a visualizer than a game, I'd say. Oh, like, you I wanted know, to play this. You know things like Milk Drop, which are just like the... I, I think it's actually called a visualizer, isn't it? When, the, when you, when you David, use a program David to... Worked... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, worked on, uh, David Kanaga that worked on uh, Proteus also worked on this. And oh, I, was I really love high, Proteus. And I just never got around to checking it out, but mm. I definitely think I would like it. And you're right, it is a visualizer, yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, uh, it's pretty interesting. I mean, it, it, there, there's not really a way of selling it besides like it's the kind of thing that would be a great experience on acid, probably. <laughs> so, if you're looking for, you know, that sort of direction to go down. There you go. Uh, what do you guys think here? Out of Armello, Darkest Dungeon, Genog, Mini Metro, Oxen Free, Panoramical for excellent visual art. <laughs> what is going on, man? This call is falling apart. Holy shit! Yeah. What happened? It's been you started... like four times. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> Oh shoot! Uh, I don't know. Detrimental to all. Yeah, you know what? Let me let me see if we can do that uh, real quick. Pardon the technical difficulties. We'll we'll be back in literally four seconds here, hopefully. And, right. uh, I'll I'll keep everybody company. Here we go. I'll just say hi, hi everyone. We're having major technical malfunction, so we're gonna be right back. Do 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 Hey, we're back now. I think. Are we truly? We might be. We'll right. be back as soon as these boxes go away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh man, one day we're gonna be on something different. One day we'll uh, we'll find a new. There we go. We're good. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me make sure we're uh, not giving away. Vital information for your everyday life, right here. There we go. I All right. Don't. I don't know who won, but this seems like a plausible mini metro victory to me. Okay. This is design you said? This is this excellent is, uh, in uh, visual. Visual design. Yeah. Visual probably art. Probably darkest dungeon. Probably uh, for me. I could see that. Yeah, I think darkest dungeon probably is the best one. Went Looks to great. You said oxen free. Yeah, yeah. oxen free look good too. Mm -hmm. Oxen free ended up being the winner there. Uh, yeah, I, really I, I would definitely. Uh, Oxen Free looks good, but I like. I love the art of Darkest Dungeon, though. So. Mm -hmm. No, I I agree with that. To be honest, I I think uh, I think Darkest Dungeon uh, it's, it, it's probably second place in quite a few categories here. Unfortunately, just you know, it's just just coming up short of uh, being excellent in one particular field, and then of course is competing against quite a few other great games for the title of. Uh, IGF's equivalent of Game of the Year as well, so interesting there. Oxenfree, though, is a pretty gorgeous game. I actually haven't had the chance, as I mentioned, to check it out much myself, but have it, you guys, anybody played Oxenfree? Nope, not yet. No, I, I've no. wanted to, but I haven't had the time. Supernatural thriller about a group of friends who unwittingly open a ghostly rift. Ooh. I heard on Kotaku it's got more contents than Civ with the Brave New World expansion. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Is that a new character you're trying out? That's that's supposed to be my impression of Ice T, but it doesn't work oh, too oh, well. Man. All right, I like <laughs> Ice T talking about indie games. I can get on board. with I'm that. a cop killer and a motherfucking handful. It doesn't really work. <laughs> it's getting out of control. Yeah. I how Was Ice Oxen Free Oxen made Bird? by the same people that made Ollie Ollie? Ollie that's, Ollie. A, <laughs> that's a great comment. <laughs> that is the best. Kudos. Kudos. Oh man, night night school studio. The team behind Oxen Free uh, doesn't look like they had anything else on their on their uh, portfolio yet. All right, let's do a couple more here. We got excellence in narrative, which her is... story. Yeah, that's her story. <laughs> do, we, yeah. do we need the, the nominees? Are pretty good. I mean, like this is yet another testament to 2015. Uh, we got Black Closet, her story, that Dragon Cancer, the Beginner's Guide, the Magic Circle, and Undertale. And honestly, like with that nominee list, I feel like there were maybe a couple of uh, games that didn't make it that I might have considered. I know Sybil uh, was a game that got a lot of attention in the GDC awards as well. I think that might have been like an honorable mention here too. Is uh, that how it's pronounced? Because I'm I've been sure. calling it I've been calling it Sibella. <laughs> I think it's Sybil. I'm pretty sure Sibella. it's Sybil. 
It might be civil. The Bella's big game hunter. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna all say her story here. Yeah, I mean, I want it to be beginner's guide, but I'm pretty sure it's not. It's her story. Her story yeah. takes it. Uh, and then let's go to well, the audience award was taken by Undertale, and uh, Toby Fox actually whipped up a pretty awesome little video for that too. So if you haven't seen that, cool. it's like 15 seconds long, but yeah, it's funny. Uh, and then finally the. Seamus McNally Grand Prize, the IGF Awards, nominees, Darkest Dungeon, Her Story, Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, Mini Metro, Super Hot, and Undertale. First time we're seeing Super Hot in the nominee list here, too. Oh, actually, streamer, it was nominated for Best Design. Oh, man, you're right. You're right. I got caught. I only knew that because chat went, Super Hot! Oh, super yeah. Hot! <laughs> What do you guys got? The grand prize. Her story. I, I mean, knowing what Ryan said kind of tints it a bit for me, but I want it to be Undertale. You want it to be Undertale? Ryan's sticking it's with her story, probably. It's, uh, it's her story. Yeah, that's a big one. Her story takes it. Uh, Mathis, talk to me about her story again, because I remember you playing it. I remember you having... Uh, it's good. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a pretty cool concept. You're basically playing like kind of a detective digging through old computer files mm -hmm. uh bringing up testimony of this murdered man's uh wife and kind of going through them most of the game takes place on like a notepad or a pen and paper as you're going through these files that are chronologically out of order and trying to take notes on whether like her uh statement from two months ago contradicts her statements now or her statement from like three months later contradicts her statements from five months ago and trying to figure out if she's actually the killer or she knows something she doesn't or she's innocent and she's just panicking uh, it's very much a puzzle story uh, a puzzle game with a heavy story that was kind of really interesting the way it was presented because the uh the actual game is presented like a like a 1995 computer screen right. um, that you're just kind of digging through old files and stuff, and you're bringing up all these uh, this footage of of interviews that she had, um, and you're just trying to piece together uh, like when this all took place based on some of her clothing and some of the dates that are on the files. It's it's really cool. I liked it a lot. It takes like the uh, for real detective elements of L.A. Noir and actually applies them to real camera footage yeah. of someone. Yep. Yeah. Yep, exactly. It's it's all it's it's FMV as Chad's saying. It's all FMV, which mm. is true. It's all it's all just this one woman acting in front of a camera, and uh, she does an incredible job with it. Uh, you're just trying to figure out if she. <clears throat> I mean, not. that's another part of her story too that I feel is maybe being overlooked a little bit. Is that well, especially when I heard Sam Barlow talking about <laughs> this uh, as he was accepting the award at IGF, he was talking about how he is encouraging people to not just make the games that you think are going to sell or you think are going to be popular, make the game that you want to make. And he yeah. did that with her story, which is clearly a, a complete outlier in uh, the gaming space right now, just because it, nothing like it, or at least I haven't seen anything even close to it uh, for definitely for like the last <laughs> 10 years, maybe like a bunch of those old school Sega CD games that pop up with the FMVs might be the most comparable. Uh, example. Night trap. Night trap. Favorite. There you go. Yeah. We apologize you guys too, by the way. To talk uh, about FMV. <laughs> This is, mm -hmm. you, you just, you've made chat go wild now that you're going to talk about actual FMV. I don't know why that's like a trigger for oh, chat. it's Dan. It's Dan Giesling. Oh, God Get damn him out of here. Dan Giesling. Yeah, Dan basically, yeah. <laughs> also need to apologize for the fact that apparently uh, Mathis' feed is transmitting one image per minute to us. Yeah, I don't know why that's the case. That's Skype. really weird. <laughs> it looks I, totally I look, fine on my end. Does yeah, it? It must just be me then. Yeah. Your internet's, oh, like, shitting on itself. Yeah, today. this has been a fun day so far. Uh, but Yo, why do we have her story, but no his, his story? Oh, shit. Where's it's the bear lot, story? IGF. God damn <laughs> We already talked about bear story. Where's my story? <laughs> <laughs> but with her story, I, I'm, like, I want to make the point that her story is an excellent game. Like, it, it is done really well. And the acting, obviously, as Mathis mentioned, is integral to uh, the game working well so I think a lot of credit needs to go to Sam Barlow and to uh, oh, I'm sorry I've forgotten the name of the actress uh, do you remember Matt? Oh, I don't Viva Seifert yeah uh, so yeah the credit to those two as well just full because... motion Viva <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> <Hi>! <laughs> the HTC Viva Seifert 
I, I there it is. Just like <laughs> primarily, I think these award or the award here, I think is merited just because not only is it something that goes uh, completely off the <laughs> charts of predicted uh, games or indie games at least to come out right now, but it's just also did it really well. So big kudos there. It's really cool. And uh, you know that... what kind of surprises me, mm-hmm. and I mean this is kind of a shitty thing to say, and I, I it's like. It comes across like even, maybe even like a little classist, which is shitty. But the top prize of the IGF is still like ten or fifteen grand, mm-hmm. and it's it's been like that since like two thousand and six. And like indie games are big business now. Yeah, I don't yeah. I don't know who's who's sponsoring yeah. these or how that happens, but that seems like before that could have been like wow, like this game is is now like it's changed my year. Mm-hmm. Now yeah. it's probably, like if you if you came out with like. Darkest Dungeon, or even her story, or or a fucking Undertale. You're like, uh, That'll pay for the... my programmers like a quarter of a salary. But yeah, right. Like, th- <laughs> thanks for the thanks for the fifteen thousand dollars. Thanks I mean, for covering rather... the cost for me to get out to this event. Pretty much, like, <laughs> yeah, it costs right. like a couple grand to be a GDC, yeah. and you, you win the award. You've paid for the convention, and then maybe like a little bit. Yeah, but. I mean, it's, ideally, it's... a lot of people are getting passes anyway if they're invited to the fucking. Uh, you know, award ceremony, That's, but I hope that they get paid travel. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like all those games that were in like the top, the top five for nominations are doing fine anyway. I'm sure, but at the same time, it's it's kind of surprising, like uh, that it, that it hasn't expanded. I guess, but maybe they want to they want to keep it small. I guess. Yeah, could be. Can can I call next year's? Because I think I already know who's gonna. Oh win. sure, no, yeah, you got predictions yeah. already. Go for it. I think it's gonna be Return of the Oberdeen. Based on the way that they judge these narrative-driven games, I think it's going to be the top, or at least in the top contenders. I think you'll probably be right. I, I can't wait for that game, though. No, yeah, I was going to say, I'm still, I am very yeah, excited. It seems to really, it really good, and it, mm-hmm. I think for me that does what, for a lot of people, her story did, uh, but a little bit more graphically, maybe. Mm-hmm. Fair. Can I make a prediction for next year? Please do. Her story. Two. Twice. <laughs> Two. Her other story. Her other story. Uh, the other, I, I'm just trying to make sure I mention real quick the other ones here. Uh, Excellence in Audio did go to Mini Metro, so there you go. Another example of that, that game's uh, credence. And then nu- Nuovo Award, which I believe is the... No, that's not the Student Award. Which one is the Nuovo Award? It's like experimental i guess oh, abstract, abstract and unconventional okay yeah abstract yeah. and unconventional Ooh, games like and that, that one went to sybil or sibele depending on who you want to believe Sibella. Uh, and then uh, oh okay. the best student game went to be glitched which i am not familiar with but there we yeah, go yeah i don't know mm-hmm. uh that'll do it for the igf gdc awards wrap up now let's move over to the unification of all gamers via rocket league oh <laughs> glorious psionics Harold oh, be the the name. podcast. <laughs> recurring segment, what's new in Rocket League? Yo, but what do you Rocket guys think League about The Witcher 3? Is... <laughs> Rocket League for Bear <laughs> is what Dota was for me like two years ago. Not even, man. Come on. I'm not, I'm not staying up till three in the fucking morning playing. You were for a very long MMR. time. I was. That's true. Now you're on the decline. Yeah. No, now I'm on like, I'm on a recoil, man. I, I kicked the habit, but now I'm totally relapsing. <laughs> Is Rocket right League here. is Rocket League a failure because Bear's only been playing it for nine months? <laughs> like I love that people, asking the real I, I love that people say that. It's like how, it's not a fail. It's like we can say it was a failure. That is not what we said. Hmm. <laughs> Rocket League Continue. Rocket League Maker has figured out PS4, Xbox One crossplay. Apparently, Psyonix knows exactly how to do it. The only issue, the only thing standing really in their way at the moment is uh, the politics and the business side of things. So, you know, I mean, there's not really a lot of explanation that needs to take place there. It's pretty obvious that uh, Microsoft and Sony are rivals and probably do not really want to, you know, interest or they don't have a ton of interest in doing things that may very well uh, boost the sales or, you know, give their competitors any sort of unnecessary advantage. So that has, of course, stood in their way for quite some time. Now, though, I mean, I don't really know what it is about Rocket League, but it just, it sort of seems like this is just the, 
this, the doors are open because we can all bat around soccer balls with rocket cars. Like, that's all it needed. That's all it took to open up Create world doors peace. to this conversation. Yeah, exactly. The console wars are over. No, I mean, dude. Because it's an easy pitch. I think people like to hear how easy it is to understand what Rocket League's about, and executives and people who don't normally grok that kind of stuff, they hear it and they're like, you oh, know what? Grok, wait, what? What is that word? Like, grok? understand. Grok. Like, grok. Wrap your head oh, around. That's a yeah, good wrap your head word. Around. Yeah, okay, please continue. Um, so, you know, when people bring that pitch to them, they go, you know what? I get that. That makes sense. That seems like synergy that we can get behind. It's got potential for marketing. It's got all sorts of cross-pollination opportunities. We could bring in all these new things, and, and why not? Let's be open-minded. I think that's why it is. I think Rock League is ubiquitous to people. I think this doesn't end the console wars. It just <laughs> opens up a new front. So now the the... <laughs> <laughs> the infantry and the foot soldiers who are fighting those battles on the internet forums can now play against one another online and actually <laughs> prove what console has the better gamers once and for all. Oh, man, I can see it now. Those Rocket League Open uh, championships are starting up. They're going to pit the PS4 players against the Xbox One players. It's got to happen. Yeah, man. Duel to the death. This is winner, the first time winner like, is all right. the people have heard Grok. I didn't know this I've was never a heard choice. That word before. That's great. I've never heard oh. Grok before. Mathis, why is Rocket League the holy grail for crossplay? It isn't. It isn't. I have no oh. answer. I have no answer for you. <laughs> it isn't. Question mark. <laughs> you're still you're still against it, man. I gotta I gotta convert you. I just don't give a shit. <laughs> Well, if but if you're playing devil's advocate, I mean, don't you think my reason is probably fairly close to why people yeah. are picking up? Don't you agree with Nick? I agree with Nick. There you go. All right. Yeah. That's fair. Later this points. spring uh, <laughs> is uh, being told that Cyanix will roll out cross-network play to its Xbox One and PC games, but it remains to be seen if Sony will be on board with it. They use the phrase "play ball" in here. I didn't want to. I didn't want to afford oh, them nice. the pun, but. <laughs> Uh, Sony, however, is, I mean, at the moment, they are the, the, uh, the number one console player. They control the market share, uh, pretty decisively, and it, yeah, I think it's really just gonna boil down to, does Sony want to play nice with Microsoft, and vis-a-vis -vis play nice with anyone who is, uh, looking forward to crossplay? Although, I mean, this really, it's sort of like, this is a weird comparison to make, but it's, it, it appeals to about as many people as are appealed to by that Rock Band 4 PC fig campaign. Like, it, it's sort of a specific thing because people are already playing Rocket League. They already have a lot of people to play against. It's not like we're experiencing any sort of lack of player population, right? And there's crossplay that already exists between Xbox One and PC and PS4 and PC. But... I guess, I mean, like, this, this of course has broader implications given the fact that this could set a precedent for crossplay between uh, Xboxes and PlayStations in the future, but at the moment, it's just, it, it really does not hold that much water. It's really just a matter of whether or not Psyonix is going to allow more people to play together. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's I, I guess, I, I'm looking forward to the uh, the potential that this has to open doors, but at the moment it is... Sort of just a hey, hey, yeah, you know this could, this could be good for all of us. Not quite yet, though. I, s I sort of feel like Sony and Microsoft are coming to terms with the fact that maybe the console is kind of an antiquated medium mm -hmm. for games transmission. Mm -hmm. And uh, like another story about that later, that may. Uh, I I, I had a that. feeling there might be. Mm -hmm. So like, and and this is not saying like anti console or anything like that, but. You know, if, if one of the major reasons to buy a console is just because your friends own that console and the network is proprietary, then, like, that seems like an artificial reason if, from a software perspective, you that, that doesn't actually exist. So, you know, I, I think knowing that the functionality is actually there, or at least plausible for many games, people are going to notice that, I hope, and be like, well, this is kind of bullshit. Like, the same way that people feel about game exclusivity right now, they're like... You know, I'd really like to not have my I'd, like. I'd like to play Sunset Overdrive and Bloodborne if we're oh, going to yeah. go back like a year. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm hoping that we're kind of working towards more fluidity there, which is me too. Which will be sweet. I think there's a bit of a shift in culture that's happened over the last three or four years, where it used to be that the hardware drove the software, and now the software is driving the hardware, uh, and now it's actually proliferated enough that people are taking notice. 
uh, with Steam being such a big distribution channel, so many indie games are filtering through so many ways they never had. Uh, all of a sudden, the software is the lead, not the big console that everyone's looking forward to. Right. So once that happens, all of a sudden, the boundaries don't really make much sense anymore. And maybe it's time to start thinking a little bit more broadly uh, than we had in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so hopefully, hopefully that does uh, spark a whole new wave of conversations. It's, uh, it's exciting news, though. I, it's really cool because, I mean, up to this point, the, the closest we've gotten to being able to play uh, against Xbox and, or, like, pit Xbox and PlayStation players against one another has been... Uh, well, no, there really hasn't been anything. I mean, like, there's been examples of uh, consoles cross-playing with PCs and pl cross-playing with Macs, and, you know, that's that's basically been it. So this is really, like, it's it's, it's a whole new uh, ball game. So, yeah, okay, there's there's the one Rocket League pun, <laughs> I guess, that we had to get in there. You're allowed one. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, worked. All right, let's, uh, let's keep talking about Sony with the PlayStation VR. Price was announced uh, last cool. week. The VR I told you itself it wasn't going to be two hundred dollars. Yeah, man, it's only four hundred dollars. Uh, what was bucks. really interesting about that news was that they were like, "It's going to be a profit generator." Yeah, like they they said that at selling them at five hundred bucks, it's actually making them money on every unit sold, which is surprising, which, considering like yeah. the price point of the of the Oculus and the Vive. You know, I'm not disparaging either of those products, obviously, but uh, it was pretty amazing that maybe they're making it really cheap for mm -hmm. whatever reason. Uh, I don't know if that reflects on its quality or anything like that, but it's uh, it'll surprising. be. I think that that's the that's the key. There is like, what are we getting for 400 bucks? What is the quality? What would be the restrictions? Um, I know Sony has said no game will be greenlit on the PSVR unless it hits 75 frames a second. And did they say 75? I think it was 75. I'm mm. almost positive it was 75. It might be 75 hertz. I, I, I know thought it was I heard 60 at second. least, but I don't know if they set like yeah. a threshold. It, it needs to meet a minimum requirement for it to even be able to be put on the VR. But the thing right. is, like, 400 bucks for VR where we currently sit is cheap. Um, now, granted, it's 400 bucks for just the headset, if but you need a camera to go with it, so it's another 60 bucks. Plus, mm. the move controllers, though optional, are probably going to be useful, which is going to be another. 50 bucks for the move controllers so you're really looking at like uh like i said like five five fifty for the bundle mm. um but even the, comparing that to the vive which comes with the move controls and stuff which is what eight hundred dollars you're still saving 300 bucks on the psvr my expectation is that it's going to be a very good kind of introductory vr headset it'll probably be uh fun to use um but not nearly as powerful as say like what a vive can do with the you know the movement uh the room scale stuff um, it'll be a much more couch-oriented experience, I'm assuming, like the Oculus. But I, I, I want to know what the, the restrictions are going to end up being, because there's no way it's going to be anywhere near as good as, like, the Vive or the Oculus. Right. So, I, I mean... Sorry, go ahead, Nick. I, I'm, I'm kind of amazed that it was able to come out that low, and then they even say they're making profit, because not only is it the headset, but it also is this box... Uh, that is doing something with Come the with signal. It, yeah. to, right. I, I'm not exactly sure to explain what it's doing, but it's doing something with the frame rate to allow it to be fast enough that the lens uh, works properly with it. Uh, I don't know how they're able to get that much technology in a headset and also that separately and still charge that little for it and say they're getting a profit. Yeah. That smacks as like too good to be true to me. So and, and chat is something's like, got to give, right? Mm -hmm. Chat is saying talk, you talk about price and not talk about PC. I mean, granted, yeah, in order to get a PC to run a Vive and an Oculus, you need to have a very powerful PC. But you can say the same of like, well, you can't get a PlayStation VR without jumping 400 on a PlayStation console. You need to, you are, it, yeah. all together you're looking at, if you want PlayStation VR, much like if you want a PC VR, you need to buy the PlayStation 400, PSVR 500. If you want to sit the, down when you're playing PlayStation right, VR, you got to consider you need a chair, right? You right, got to be... <laughs> There's rent as well. But like, you can't, you can't be like, well, don't, don't forget about the PC price. I'm like, yeah, but there's a P PlayStation price that comes along with it. Mm. Um, I just don't know. It, it's just the cheapest option at, besides gear, obviously. But like, gaming option, PlayStation VR will be the cheapest. And I already know people who are planning on getting the PlayStation VR who have PCs that are powerful enough to run like Vive and Oculus, but don't. They want to get the PlayStation one because it's it's a, it's a cheaper entry to barrier or yeah. barrier to entry rather. I think that's where the PlayStation is gonna succeed in that the VR price tag is gonna allow people who 
are interested in VR to grab it, but not diehard fans of it, like people like us who may have already tried it and really love it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's got to be what they're aiming for, too. I think, with like, Sony's not dumb. They know who the competitors are. They know who's dominating the marketplace right now. So they're very well aware of the, of the fact that Oculus and Vive have sort of a, a corner on the PC market, so naturally, well, of course, A, they're the PlayStation VR, so they're probably going to be on the <laughs> PS4, but then B, like, that is their target audience, is the people that really aren't sure whether or not this is something that they want to get into. So this is hopefully going to push a lot of people from early adopter into, you know, uh, getting into the trend, ideally, when it starts to develop, uh, that VR will hopefully create. So I like this uh, as an entry-level headset. Spec-wise, like, I'm looking at the full specifications page right now over on the PlayStation VR website, and it doesn't really seem like it's that different from the tech specs on the Vive and the Oculus. I mean, you've got the 1080 resolution on both eyes. Uh, well, okay, apparently it's got, like, a, a 960 or something like that. Is I, I don't know exactly even how to read what they're telling me right here on the page, but I have read that the resolution is a little worse than, uh, than it is on the Vive and the Oculus, so uh, there's that. Okay. Um, I would hope. Yeah, for that exactly. to make any sense. Exactly that it would be right. Worse, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, otherwise, yeah, it's it's probably not really going to be like I, I compare looking at a specifications page for something like this to looking at say like a specs page for a microphone or something like that. Like you, if you're buying a microphone, you see things like uh, ohm resistance and impedance and uh, all those sorts of numeric values that really don't matter that much at all to normal people who just need to know, does this sound good? And will it yeah. eliminate background noise, that kind of stuff? Like, there's three main things primarily that you're concerned about with that purchase. I think the same thing applies to VR, where you're, mo you're mostly concerned about a few things. A, does it have a high enough resolution? B, is it comfortable? And then C, like, maybe, like, your field of view or your... Frame uh, rate. Yeah, frame rate, stuff like that. So, other than that, we're not really worried too much about... Uh, the the exact specifications like the like the refresh rate too I suppose is uh, worth yeah. considering but that's also sort of uh, in congruence with the field of view or sorry not with the field of view the uh, frame rate. I, I mean I think people going into grabbing the PSVR should just understand that I don't think you're going to get the same experience as you would get with an Oculus or a Vive but I think you'll have a good entry level experience nonetheless. Mm -hmm. It's going to put a little bit of the onus on the developers to be able to work around the specifications to create things right, that yeah, aren't limited by the hardware. And true. if they're creative and they do it right, they can make some great stuff. It's just going to be that you can't expect perfectly naturalistic graphics right. on this anymore. It's, I mean, it wasn't really happening on the PS4 as it is. Uh, but this is a limiting factor that's going to take it down a couple notches. Yeah. yeah, it's going to push your, it's going to push the the PlayStation Four even harder. So you're going to see a lot less good looking games on the PSVR. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, uh, this isn't even necessarily like uh, completely relevant to the PlayStation VR. It's just the fact that they do this. Uh, can we not restrict the time frame of pre-orders anymore? Like. Pre-orders in and of themselves are a promise to purchase the product, but now they're like they're they're saying pre-orders will be available soon. It's just such oh, a you want to pre-order the pre-order. Yeah. Why? <laughs> why do we need? Why is that on a Sign schedule? Sign up here to be first in line to pre-order a thing to then get it early. <laughs> How deep is yeah. it gonna go? It's getting ridiculous. This is gonna be out in October of 2016, but pre-orders are not available until the March 29th. So if you were hoping to promise Sony that you would give them money later this year, you're going to have to wait until next week to do that. Sorry in advance. Uh, the Oculus is going to be in homes in a couple of weeks. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's right in there, man. Yeah. And then the Vive 2 is going to be shipping very shortly as well. Mm -hmm. The Vive 2. Yeah, they've already oh, oh, <laughs> missed the pre-order schedule. Yeah, you're God damn it. <laughs> it's all moving too fast, man. Uh, speaking of things moving pretty quick, uh, we now, I don't know if you guys have seen this already, uh, just a quick little teaser, I'm not gonna show the whole thing, but I'm just gonna show part of it now, for Virtual Desktop 1.0. So, uh, this was just put up on YouTube a couple of days ago. It's, I mean, it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like, so it is the Sit Oculus... Sit mushroom and watch videos? Yeah, more or less. <laughs> Look, dude, till you try it... Don't fucking rip on my branch mushroom experience anymore. It's, it's a beautiful thing. I want to give you some credit, Bear, because you answered a question that no one else could answer. And that question was, when you get your new Oculus Rift and pop it out of the box and hook it up, what's the first thing you're going to do with it? 
when I posed that question to Twitter, 90% of the responses were porn. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> of I'm not even saying it like I like I, I, I have a problem with that or anything. It's just like I wanted to aspire to something that was a bit more catered to this technology. Uh, and I, I suppose desktop VR would be a, at least a step in the right direction Look, for that. man, we can all sit here and pretend that we are interested in these 3D panoramic pictures and we want to watch Cirque du Soleil perform for us on our couch. But <laughs> let's be real. We all just we all just want to see right. some virtual titties, don't we? Come on. Let's be well, honest with each other. It's that, part of the plan. It's part of the long-term plan. It's just not <laughs> the outset move. Uh, so you guys are seeing on the on the video feed, if you're watching live on Twitch or on the VOD on YouTube, uh, you're seeing a video of virtual desktop. And, well, okay, so in a nutshell, a lot of it is basically, oh, I can do exactly what I do on a PC, but with a headset on, right? Yeah. Like, you're, just, you're sort yeah, of looking I mean, around yeah. at your desktop and you, you're watching video and stuff. Like, the, what's happening now is you're seeing the uh, the desktop showing up on the monitor, and this is actually what the home theater looks like in uh, Gear VR as well, so I guess the Oculus one is the same, which isn't surprising. Uh, but yeah, this is like the home theater setup that you see in your headset. So, it's cool, of course, that you can, you know, connect your desktop, what you're seeing on your desktop, to the VR headset, which is, you know, that, <laughs> I think it's, it's more, it's not really trying to necessarily to impress you with uh, what's going on on screen right now, but this is more of like the foundation for what VR can be. So like when we can connect our actual desktop projection to what we can see in here, of course, that I, I imagine would open up uh, ways to uh, integrate a whole bunch of other stuff too. So it's, it's good. It's, uh, it's Why is getting, getting us further to, or it's getting us closer to that, uh, that Wally reality where none of us ever have to leave our chairs and it's all just- I don't know, man. <laughs> you don't I've think been so? Biting, I've been biting my tongue this whole time. But I feel like the technology that is really going to make VR sing, maybe not the technology, but the software that is really going to make VR impressive is not just what we think it will be right now. Like, I think it's going to be stuff that we won't be able to really yeah. understand until we have, like, a few years with VR. Like, yeah. I keep watching this stuff. Like, a virtual desktop, there's got to be some form of that so you can navigate, you know, your computer. Yeah. In VR like this space. is a foundational thing, is basically what I'm getting at. But I like in the trailer, he also like goes and sits in a movie theater, and it's just like an empty movie theater. He's watching a movie, and I'm like, why? Why is that still the thing yeah. that is like the selling point? That's like when whenever they do like motion controls, and they're like, you can when you wave your arms, you wave your arm on the screen. It's, it's like, like we it's were cool. originally being pitched the Connect. Like the the yeah, entire exactly. idea of the Connect was what we were being sold on. I'm with you, man. I don't want to sit in a freaking virtual movie theater with a heavy thing on my head for no reason when I could just not be wearing that. Yeah, or like, I guess have it optimized to actually fill the space of the VR or or something more VR specific than just basically filling your field of vision with like empty chairs. Yeah. Like that, to me, you actually feel weird, like but... you're surrounded by empty chairs, Ryan. But I, I, I mean, I don't you do. Be, like, I mean, you I mean, do. <laughs> Let's be real. But the, don't people want the experience of being at the movie theater, but like at home? I mean, it, but they want it because of the big screen and the sound and, and stuff like that, right? And the popcorn is not like, I want to sit in this room. No, honestly, my favorite yeah, the room part is, is not the upholstery the... around me. That's really what, like, that makes the whole movie going experience for me. I don't know, man. I, I just feel like this is, like, tech demo stuff. And we'll look back on this in, like, I hope we'll look back on this in, like, 10 years and be like, remember when we thought VR was going to be, like, everybody would put on their headset and sit in a virt virtual movie theater together. Mm. Like, there, I, I hope yeah. that there's going to be stuff that right now... Or it's like, going to be like, Ryan, I'll see you imagine. in the virtual movie theater later tonight. Yeah, we'll be like, yeah man, oh, really we'll both put on our headsets and <laughs> go look at like a shitty 3D model. Because it's not like it take a, pic no, that's, a picture that's of your actual body. Man. <laughs> the HoloLens. I don't know, man. Like, I know we do like VR Corner every week now because there's always VR news, but... Like, I'm still waiting on... The Vive did it for me with Fantastic Contraption, and I was, like, actually building shit and watching it go and then, like, able to move around the environment, and it, it felt really immersive. But, like, this, it, all these movies, man, I'm like, just it's remove the, the roller chairs. coasters. Exactly. It's like, I also don't care about, like, a roller coaster sim on, on VR. Oh, At least... I want to do it once, and then exactly. I'm <laughs> Yeah, I, I vomit. 
I want to get the the one app that every uh, piece of VR is going to come with that lets you ride a roller coaster, right. and then I'm done. <laughs> and you will puke afterward. It is not a fun experience. Why is it so bad for the motion sickness? I don't really know why. Because my body's expecting like the force, and then we go down, and you're oh. like, oh, so then my stomach sinks, but doesn't get like the force, and it's just okay, like okay, it's a disconnect uh, between your mind and your body. I yep, got it, and I want to vomit. Dude, the, some of the rides at Universal Studios Japan hit me hard with that. Like, there's some that are roller coaster simulations, but the chair just, it does it isn't a roller coaster. It just, like, tricks your brain into thinking it. Oh, really? The Spider-Man ride drops you, like, 400 feet in simulation, but it actually drops you, like, two inches in real life. And I was oh, like, oh, I'm going to oh, I'm gonna die. <laughs> Well, okay. To be fair, again, I mean, like with the video we're watching here, like, this is this is literally a tech demo. So I, I, we shouldn't, you know, set the bar too high for what we're what we're expecting from this. Uh, but as far as how VR is impressing me beyond the novelty of sitting in that home theater, uh, I, I believe I talked about a game, Esper. I think it is. I'm pretty sure it's called Esper. Yeah. Uh, which is a game that actually pretty effectively utilizes three-dimensional interaction with the space surrounding you, which I think is a, a core concept that will probably be expanded on a lot more. And, you know, to the idea of what Ryan is suggesting that just probably there are things that we don't even necessarily comprehend yet that will probably make a lot more sense in a few years when VR is or when VR has become more mainstream, ideally. So I... I, I Absolutely, uh, already am seeing examples of it that I am really impressed by. I, I enjoyed Esper, and you know, while it certainly wasn't anything uh, groundbreaking in terms of actual gameplay innovation, it was really just a basic puzzle game that utilized 3D interaction. It was still, you know, it is encouraging that those are already starting to come up. But I, I think it, it is still worth appreciating uh, this ground level stuff too, because while it is easy to be jaded to uh, just, you know, all this very basic virtual reality stuff. And I, I totally empathize with that, too. I, I, I do want to, you know, at least make note of the fact that this is, uh, you know, probably going to open up a lot of doors for people to make better virtual reality stuff, which is really exciting. Yeah. Uh, I agree. So somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm very enthusiastic the thing. for it. Yeah. It's going to take time, I'm sure. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say, like, oh, the human brain cannot possibly fathom I'm just saying, like, it's because iterative. it's... Yeah, exactly. And it's a new medium. So, like, imagine you lived in a world where, like, movies didn't exist. And then you're like, what would you want to see on a movie? I don't know. How about, like, a train? Just show me a train <laughs> that, like, goes into the screen, right? Like, that. that's where we are, I hope, with VR right now. Yeah, I mean... And like then in, like... 80 years we'll have like the avatar of VR that people are like, whoa, this is amazing. <laughs> but right now we're at like six seconds of man sneezing and everybody's like, oh, this is novel. <laughs> yeah. This is amazing technology. Like, I, when you think about it too, that's, that's literally how the film industry started was when people discovered yeah. how to actually create films. They didn't know what to do with them. They were just like, let's, let's put fucking like vaudevillian chase scenes up there and everybody will love that. And they did for a minute, but then they were like, okay, this is... I, like we we love this innovation, we love films, but these are all terrible. Can we, can we start like making some actual good stuff? This is a new movement in the field of this technology. It's it's not like the way what we're looking at it is sort of like it's a subdivision of gaming or something. Mm -hmm. But this is another form of media. The way television, film, like all of these very particular ways of approaching telling a story or whatever you're trying to do, make an interactive experience, are done. So it's maybe a bit naive even to not get that point already that this is just the stepping stone. We're just starting off with really infantile stuff. Uh, but to see that potential and go forward, I mean, this is just how it's going to go, whether we like it or not. Right. But, you know, the, the cat's out of the bag now. You're not, you're not going backward. Yeah. Right. Oh, man. Sweet. It's going to be fun, though. I, I, I love the future, man. I, I'm still just, I, I still have a little bit of that childlike wonder reserved for virtual reality. And while, while my Gear VR is uh, now collecting dust on the shelf, I'll be honest about it, uh, it still like, I, I mean, I pop it on from time to time, but it's, it's usually just like to check out what's maybe on the store, if there's anything new that I want to check out. Uh, there's actually a, a fishing game. Which is just just straight up exactly what you think it is, but it is kind of nice. I mean, so to 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 sell the point that yeah, it is still appealing to do some of these just silly little 
basically proof of concept games where it's like, hey, I have an idea. In virtual reality, you could go to a tropical island and fish, and it's super yeah. relaxing. And they're like, yeah, you could do that, and then they did it, and it works exactly how you think it is. So, as as someone who is learning programming, like. 2D gaming is like you have to be pretty smart mm. to wrap your head around that. In 3D gaming, you have to be like a genius. People who are making shit in VR is really intimidating. It's like yeah. you're yeah. you're programming like in four dimensions right now. I I'm gonna need to go get like a PhD in <laughs> in some form of mathematics to understand yeah. what you're doing. I mean, like as dramatic as it sounds, they are basically like the the pioneers of a new technology, more or less. Yeah, no doubt. Mm. All right, well, uh, let's go on to the next thing here. Firewatch, a game that we all certainly had opinions on. Uh, doing quite well. Doing extremely well uh, for a single-player game at that, too. Uh, has sold 500,000 units, which is really, really impressive. Uh, Panic, the publisher, announced the sales in a retrospective post on their blog. It's been the top-selling downloadable game on the PS Store in February. Uh, obviously considered a sales success. Uh, this is uh, this is more of just a let's applaud Firewatch story. <laughs> so is that like... <laughs> I actually find it... Yeah, go ahead. No, please, after you. I, was say, I actually find it interesting because another sales figure got lo- uh, released that was in a similar genre, Soma, oh, has really? only sold 250,000. Wow. All right. And I would consider them in very similar genres, exploration, story-driven games. And uh, I've been reading a few blogs as why people think Soma didn't do as well as, like, say, Firewatch, I think is one actual example that somebody wrote about. And people are wondering if it's, like, the shoehorned gameplay elements when it comes to the monsters and all that stuff, where Mm. Firewatch was much more focused on its genre, while Soma was trying to be maybe too many things at once. I think it was the marketing, honestly. I think Firewatch has had a better presence in marketing in general, and Soma was a bit uh, enigmatic about their approach with how they wanted to uh, put this story to players. And I think part of that was necessary for them to tell the story properly. Uh, So they sort of maybe hamstring themselves before they even started by the way they had to tell that story, which is unfortunate because it was a great story, and and it's sad Mm -hmm. that not a lot of people have seen it, or not as many people as I think should have have seen it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoehorn this into a mildly controversial topic here. I don't know if you guys saw a post that was made yesterday uh, by Ryan Green, who I believe was one of the developers on That Dragon Cancer. Uh, yes. He posted something on Let's Plays. Uh, the, the main note, I, I won't read the whole thing, it really even summarizes. It's just the main note here was that, uh, well, let's just read the last paragraph here. It says, we we're asking that you return the favor in creating Let's Play videos, that you don't just rebroadcast the entirety of our content with minimal commentary, but instead use portions of our content as a context to share your own stories and start conversations with your viewers. We would encourage you to link to our site and directly encourage viewers to support our work financially through buying the game or donating a dollar or two to our studio if they believe that what we did has value. Now, first of all, if you're doing uh, YouTube or Twitch and you're not including a link to the game that you're playing uh, wherever possible, ideally, of course, on YouTube and the link to the description, Please do that, because that's just the easiest thing you can do, and everyone should do it. Please include a link to the game you're playing so people can buy it for themselves. Um, So I want to make sort of an interesting uh, comparison here between these two games. So Firewatch and That Dragon Cancer, primarily both single-player experiences, primarily story-driven games uh, that really uh, demand that the players uh, invest themselves in the narrative to really enjoy it. But, of course, that can be spoiled uh, if you watch, say, someone play the entire game through on Twitch or YouTube. Obviously, that sort of taints your experience, makes you a little bit less likely uh, to purchase the game for yourself, I would imagine, if you've already seen basically entirely what the game has to offer. I think both Firewatch and That Dragon Cancer got a substantial amount of YouTube and Twitch coverage. I think there were quite a few people playing both of those games. Uh, Maybe a few more for Firewatch, honestly. I think That Dragon Cancer was maybe a little bit more niche. Uh, but still, I, like they, they both present the position of games that require you to, uh, or really just games that are only good for one sitting, more or less. Not a lot of replay value there. So uh, I sort of just want to want to hear opinions uh, just based on the statements there. Uh, just whether you guys feel that like the single player experiences are, you know, 
Whether or not his point is valid, I guess. Because when you look at the sales figures, too, you see that Firewatch obviously doing quite well. 500,000 units sold to, compared to that Dragon Cancer, which <clears> didn't <throat> do uh, quite so well. Well, uh, before I get into like, the Let's Play thing, I think the difference between those two games is just... That Dragon Cancer is such a heavy subject matter. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. a very small portion of people actually want to go and play it. I did not pick up that game because... I don't want to deal with that kind of that that particular thing. I've yeah. dealt with cancer more than my fair share in life, and I I know the pains, and I don't want to go play that game. Like, and I think that's the line there. I don't think the let's plays have hurt that dragon cancer. I think there's just a lot of people who don't necessarily want to broach an uncomfortable subject matter like that because yeah. it's just not comfortable. Whereas mm. Firewatch. Is one of those games Firewatch that did, I mean, let's let's be fair though. Firewatch did have pretty heavy subject matter too, pretty emotional yeah, but, experience. But it blindsides you, and you don't it know blinds, it's coming. Yeah, exactly. It's a little bit more different, and the way it's presented, even just graphically, is a lot more uh, lighthearted. Uh, there's a lot more comedy in, involved in it. Well, I mean, no, uh, the the start. I mean, think about how the game introduces the text you to what's in the beginning, going on. Sure. Yeah. I mean that. Yeah, like, but you don't without have like, spoiling like yeah, the yeah. actual twist. It doesn't come out and say, this is a game about right. blank, yeah. blank. Yes, yeah. yes, right? yes. Right? Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and I would say, uh, with Fire, like games like Firewatch, I think you got two types of people. People who are going to play Firewatch, um, but they want to see what the game is like first, so they'll watch like maybe an episode yeah. or 10 minutes of an episode and be like, is this something I'm into? I'll go check it out. And then people who are like, eh, I could take it or leave it. I'll just watch somebody play it. I, I, I'm hard-pressed to say Let's Plays are the reason that Dragon Cancer didn't do well. I just think the subject matter is super freaking sensitive for a lot of people. Yeah, that's a good argument. I also, I, I, I feel like I actually empathize with the post a lot. And I think it's easy <laughs> to be like, uh, you know, oh, well, you know, like Phil Fish style. Like, if you don't want us covering your game, then fine. Right. Like, enjoy right. the lack of free press. Yeah. But I think there is probably a certain contingent of people who would have bought the game that instead just watched it. I don't know what percentage it is. I don't know if it's 100%. I don't know if it's 2%. But it, the, the argument that he makes kind of goes into some reasoning that I'm not comfortable with when it gets to the point where it's like if everybody who watched the millions of people who watched like the big YouTubers play it just gave us a dollar, then like that would have been more than enough money to sustain us yeah. and you're like well yeah i mean that's that's how we feel too like if everyone who watched <laughs> yeah. right if if we got 10 cents of view on youtube from every viewer we'd be like that's incredible like yeah. we'll, we'll be buying bugattis right <laughs> like racing it, our it's it's just racing. not the way like this economy works Totally and unrelated not... tangent there, real quick. I, I read something <laughs> online the other day that said, like, the average Bugatti owner, like, the average Bugatti shopper owns something like nine cars, uh, a jet, and a yacht. Like, that's their oh, average yeah. assets. Every YouTuber. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, when you get to the point where you're kind of like, well, even if, if you're thinking, like, 10% of people who watched a million view video were actually going to buy the game, like, you're... Incorrect. I'm not going to be rude and say you're out of your mind, but you're incorrect, you know? It's it's just the way that this kind of online economy works, that maybe only 1% of those people or 0.1% of those people were ever going to buy the game anyway. Mm -hmm. Which is still shitty that if, like, 0.1% or if 10% of that 0.1% would have bought it, that would have made a huge difference, maybe financially, but... It I, also I depends like... on the YouTuber, too. I mean, and their yeah. audience. So, as an example, Jacksepticeye covered that Dragon Cancer. If you think his audience is going to buy that game, then you're nuts. Yeah. He's his audience is kids, and and they don't watch him. They, they don't watch his channel for the games he's playing. They watch him to, because he's like screaming all the time, because high he's energy. Jack. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So I mean, it really. It, you also have to look at at the people who are covering your game. And there's a reason I think a lot of people don't cover single player games as well because it's not as engaging as something like. A roguelike where I can play it and somebody else can play it, and we have two totally different experiences, and it's it's a symbiotic relationship. I... Ideally, it would always be a symbiotic relationship. And yeah, agreed. I, mm. I, I have 
some pretty strong opinions on this one, too, because I've fought this very concept a lot in my own mind, uh, having done a Let's Play the Beginner's Guide, which is a very one-time playthrough game. Uh, at the end of the whole thing, I was really moved by it. I thought we had, like, the whole experience between me and the community, having experienced it together, was meaningful. And I felt legitimately guilty for having potentially taken away sales from them. And I kind of just, like, apologized at the end because I didn't really know what else to do because I didn't know what the game was. I played it blind. Yeah, I've, I mean, I mean, you've probably got a bit of a pass with the beginner's guide in particular. I think you don't need to worry so much about it. I, no, I know I, I probably don't, but at the same time, it's a bigger issue than just that one game. And how do you approach those sorts of games exactly in the future? Because the same sort of thing happens with Soma. I like to believe that I get into them with such a, a frame of mind that we're having discussion throughout it. Mm -hmm. And it's transformative in more than just the, the minimum way that people do to post YouTube content and stuff like that. Uh, but it doesn't always hold up for every Let's Player in every situation for every game. So to make a broad generality and say, like, this is the policy we want to have, uh, you know, live by it or don't, we're going to have problems if you don't, like, that seems overly reductive yeah. Yeah. Uh, for them to make a statement like that. And it sort of undermines the, the symbiosis that we have for the, the good experiences. And there's going to be bad experiences no matter who you're talking to. You're catering to the least common denominator. When you put a game out into the public, there's always going to be people who play it in a way that undermines the content. Hopefully there's enough people who add to the content, though, to make it worth it and pass on that link and make you buy it. Yeah. That's I, all I can do is recommend that I, people buy it. Right. Like I want to I wanna mention, by the way, real quick, like, I don't, I don't want to make this seem like we're throwing shade at, <laughs> of any sort at the Dragon Cancer, or that Dragon Cancer, the developers of that game. I, I think this post was not made in any malicious manner. I think, in fact, they're, they're mostly concerned with the people that were purely like posting gameplay, you know, just like posting straight yeah. up ripped videos of the game without any commentary. Yeah. I think that's that's for that's the most the part yeah. what they're concerned about. Um, but they talk to about this is another point that Mathis made that I want to get back to. They talk about the millions of views that the game generated on YouTube, right? Like they they talk about just the millions upon millions across different channels. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to YouTube right now and see the top search results for. Please that do, yeah, YouTube no, that's search. extremely relevant. Because talking about Jack Septicai and people like that, Mathis made an excellent point, which is really like the, the major point that needs to be made here is that a lot of the time, for those big YouTubers, they don't, they really do not care what they're playing. It almost literally doesn't matter. Like they're pulling up fucking flash games. I remember playing back in like yeah. 2009, uh, just for myself, and they're getting like millions of views. With that stuff, I don't think the developers of Stick RPG are throwing a bunch of fits I about mean, it. But I mean, I'm looking at the top search results, mm -hmm. and it's like number one search result, Jack Septicai, two and a half million views. Yeah, that probably next, accounts for the majority of the millions they're referring to. Ne too. Next, next is I has Cupquake. Her, her, she did it in two parts. Mm -hmm. Those both parts total seven hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Then it goes down to like fifty thousand right? below for everybody else, and yeah. then further and further and further lower. So like two big names covered it, and the rest are smaller YouTubers with uh, ten to twenty thousand views apiece on the first page. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the second page, and of course it gets smaller and smaller. Yeah. Eight hundred views, two thousand views. So if they're saying millions of views, my guess is they were like that Dragon Cancer, Jack yeah. Septic guy, two and a half million views. Do they not realize his audience is kids? And I has Cupquake. I'm vaguely familiar with her, and she's mostly known for Minecraft. I think, I think so. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And like, and uh, that kind of thing. So like, the audience of those two YouTubers mm. together, I think, are relatively young. Um, so the majority of the content and coverage is sort of misdirected in its uh, uh, targeting. Right. Yeah. 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 I don't think the audience would that would be watching. Jack would not be would be one that would go out and buy this game without knowing what it is. So all the big name coverage, so to speak, was not necessarily nuanced in the way that they probably wished it was. Yes, it was right. full playthroughs. Yeah. Like That's Jack's video is the, his one video is the whole game. So I mean, oh the the point there is that two and a half million people wanted to watch Jack Septicai play that dragon cancer like that and it could have been anything yeah exactly like could have that been is man rpg that is the fact of the matter so i i think just 
you you almost have to invalidate this almost entirely based on that. But uh, how do you even yeah. carry through a let's play of a game that heavy when your commentary is as light as it is? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you make that journey through a game like that without paying it any acknowledgement? Right. I don't even understand how that works. I, I couldn't do that. So, like, <laughs> I did I did a let's play a few years ago of uh, Brothers: A Tale of Two Sons. Uh, I yeah, think that was probably the last game that I played on my channel that, you know, really fell into that same threshold of, you know, purely narrative driven single player experiences. Right. And I like part of me realized it as I was playing it, too. I was like, you know what? I, I sort of I don't want to keep making videos of this. I, I just want to play it and tell people to keep playing it. Because yeah. it's, uh -huh. you know, like, it's that good. There's very few games that have that effect, by the way. I, I want to make note of the fact that Brothers of Tale of Two Sons is an excellent game. Like, a very, very good I agree. Game. I recommend yep. it, too. Um, so, yeah, it is. I, I think this is maybe just the virtue of circumstance that we've already uh, gone over pretty substantially. That, you know, it's, I, I think the blame is a little misplaced. I absolutely understand the frustration of people that were just, you know, ripping straight up gameplay video. I still think that's... While I understand, you know, like for walkthrough purposes, the people do that. I, I still just, I, I really hope that people aren't trying to build channels entirely based off of playing through games mm. without commentary. Like, just, I don't know about that. But people rip trailers and monetize them. I've seen that happen yeah, a lot. Yeah, that too. It's just, yeah, there's a gray area all the time, man. But yeah, I just like, I don't know. I, I've been quiet over the past little bit because I do feel like it's, it's like punching down a little bit. Yeah. It's like. Uh, not only was your game like it comes from an incredible place of personal tragedy, then it wasn't financially successful and you vented about it. Here's why like your vent post is bullshit. Yeah. But I I do I do tend to agree that like this is I, I mean I guess I never saw from my preconceived notions, I never saw that Dragon Cancer as a game that was gonna be financially successful. Mm. It it I seemed like it was a, to be. Yeah, it, right. it, I mean, it's of course you want it to be because you have a team of people working on it and you're you're putting it for sale. But like, I I figured that it was kind of like a personal project that it was born out of this period of it, it, incredible tragedy, and then it was going to whatever happened happened. I guess it was like to make the game as almost like a therapeutic experience. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say like making it and also wanting financial support out of it is like not noble or something like that. But right, right. I I do I guess I tend to agree that like if. If the majority of people who watched it watched it on a channel that is probably not really demographically focused around selling the game, then I I don't think you can really look at that as like lost sales. Yeah. If if anything, right. it's probably promotion. But um, and I know a lot of people are saying like, well, YouTubers have sold me games too. Like if I hadn't watched NL, I wouldn't know about Isaac. Or right, you know, right. people are talking about Stark Valley. But that it, it's a little different in that those games are also like mechanically focused. As opposed to a game like, I mean, even Brothers has puzzles and stuff in it that yeah. that kind of drag gameplay. Mm -hmm. um, something that's explicitly narrative focused is is a little different. But at, at the same time, I do believe the post is kind of misguided. But I I, I hesitate to be like you know, here's which is how why I don't think it was so heavily covered. Like yeah. I, I, when you when you YouTube it, like no big names with the exception of one like covered it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't, I don't want to beat a dead horse here either, but it's just like you're making a good, a good point. On the flip side of this coin, how many people would have even known about that Dragon Cancer were it not for Jack's video? Well, I feel like it, it was a game that got coverage from like traditional sources yeah. because it has yes. a great story. So like writers were writing about it and bloggers were blogging about it, but like videos, uh, let's players a little bit less so because it, it's less engaging for video content I think yeah it's difficult for people I think that take it on seriously the way that it needs to be taken on to be that vulnerable and emotive while they're playing through a game like that you have to be in a very particular headspace and to allow the audience to see you actually taking that information in and internalizing it is difficult right so expecting that from people who necessarily are there to make you laugh it, it doesn't necessarily mesh um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just it didn't hit the right people that would play it the right way. Right. I think we're yeah. That's that's that there. Uh, cool. Glad we uh, glad we brought that one up though. That was a fun conversation. A good discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's have a let's have a salty conversation just to balance things out a little bit. Right. Ark Survival of the Fittest 
was announced last week. Uh, free multiplayer yes. online survival arena, Amosa, I guess is what this is being called. Oh! <laughs> Shit. Then uh, add multiplayer and some mimosa. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nice. Oh, man. I was trying to think of a way to do it. I'm, I'm glad you were quick on the draw. Well, but, uh, I mean, it already has multiplayer, so it was a bit of a stretch. Yeah, but, you know. but a multiplayer, multiplayer online survival arena. There you go. Uh, pits as many as 72 <laughs> combatants against one another in the Strollo survival in a harsh threat to fight people in Ark, more or less. Uh, yet another in the uh, long list of entries now in the... Uh, what has apparently been dubbed the MOSA genre, not necessarily an acronym that I want to get behind at the moment. Uh, so, I, don't, I mean, this is... how? When does it end? <laughs> when, when will we stop, we'll we'll stop buying them? Yeah, I, 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 have we reached peak cynicism Critical in the genre mass, already? It, it, I, I only... I played the culling for the first time yesterday, and I was like, this is pretty novel. This is kind of fun. Okay, so you're behind, near... Man. I wouldn't you're say behind. it was novel, but it was fun. <laughs> well, I, I didn't touch H1Z1 Battle Royale, mm. or I don't even know what the other ones are at Rust, this point. Daisy. Is Rust, like... Rust, well, Rust, has Rust is... No, Daisy doesn't has a, have, like, a King of the Hill mode, does it? Mm. They they do tournaments for it. They do their, their own little, like, 21-player, like... Uh, uh, survival mode thing. Um, I, my perception of this right now is that it's kind of like, um, I hope it's like when people were making custom games for Warcraft 3 and Starcraft. And then they're like, oh, how many like Dota mods do we need? But now the MOBAs, they were their own genre. Yeah. I, I, I've still got at least like, I think a year until I'm, I'm sick of these ones and in all, the same way that I'm sick of like open world survival games. And it all started with Arma too. Arma... Armor mod that created this like battle royale thing. Yeah. Um, it's good. No, I mean, I think calling's great. Don't get me wrong. And people love Ark, so that's good. I think I, I I probably am playing it up a little bit just for the hell of it. But it is well. I also may be a lot more acutely aware of it too. I wasn't necessarily as in tune with the industry as I was back when the mobas were starting to surface. So I think now that I <laughs> am paying a lot more attention to this stuff, I'm starting to see. Wow, this is really a lot of people are jumping on this train really fast here. The Mosa though, there's just well, I. I guess it, 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 yeah, though they're, they're pretty closely aligned, aren't they? The, the rise of prominence of the MOBA, and now the MOSA is, uh, God, I hate myself when I say that out loud. I need to think of something else to come up <laughs> with. Uh, it, it is, All uh, the genres are converging, it feels like to me. For a the the MOBA is the right? survival yeah. games, the, the mm -hmm. character action driven, uh, class based first person shooters. They're all turning into one gray blob. <laughs> and maybe in three years that'll happen and then we can move on out of that. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, that's Is just... Ark bad? Honest question. I don't like it at all. I've played you it. You also played it with like six months ago, right? Yes. So I haven't played it recently. So is that not it's not terrible. Okay. Um I consider it kinda average. Mm-hmm. But for what reason? Because it doesn't do anything new. It's like here's a survival game. Because Ark initially was a survi an online survival game, right. like Rust, mm -hmm. like whatever. You build a base, you gather resources, you kill animals, you make better weapons, you get a you get a spear, and then you know later on you get guns and all that stuff. And it's like, all right, it didn't do anything exceptionally different. I know people really like it, and I think mechanically it worked fine, but it just didn't like grab me. And I could give a shit about this version of Ark, to be honest. So, when I played Ark six months ago, I mean, I feel like I, not to use an overused phrase, but I actually feel like I'm taking crazy pills when I play a game like Ark, because it's, it's so clunky and it looks shitty, doesn't it? Like, it looks, it looks really I think it looks bad. Good. No, I thought I, it looked good. When I played it, it just, like, it just, uh, all the characters, uh, okay, I don't know if this is by design, but they look like they're made of fucking blocks, literally. Like, they look like Lego. Well, because everybody and their grandmother makes their character, like, two feet tall Danny DeVito replicas. <laughs> like, <laughs> Dude, that is what true. everybody does. <laughs> 
But it just, it felt like, it definitely felt like an early access game. It felt, just clunky is the best way I, word I can use to describe it. Because, I mean, even the, the user interface, too, just felt so hard to get into. And just off-putting, really. I don't know, I just, I, when I look at these games, I, I see the trailers for them. I, I remember in particular too. Uh, okay, the the game where you uh, you're you're flying in. A, it's a survival game. The Mathis you probably played. You're flying in a plane. You crash. The forest. Yeah. Yep. The forest. So like that is basically in, along the same lines of how I was describing Ark, right? They're more or less. No, the same. man. There aren't dinosaurs in the forest. <laughs> Not it's yet. Cannibal mutants. <laughs> All right. Different. Learn your differences, Bear. Am I alone uh, in that? I don't know. But that's that's what my point is like. That's why Ark didn't stick out because yeah, it, it's basically well, Chad's like, well, they added animal taming, so <laughs> like that. Yeah, I don't know. With these these perks that they keep touting as the big deal about the game, almost never draw me to the game. Yeah, and shit. since they're all in early access, you can't ever claim, well, this one's going to be graphically brilliant. It's not there. You can't say it's done. Yeah. So uh, they're always riding on these promises that never have been finished yet. No, not we saying have... they're not but. I haven't seen them. <laughs> we have so many great examples of early access games now where I feel like we can't use that as a, as a crutch for an argument anymore. Like, it just it doesn't hold water for me now. It, there's, there's a lot of developers that have shown a near-finished product in early access that have continued to improve upon it in notable, meaningful ways. And but what what survival games? That's though? what I was just about. Right, to say. What yeah. survival games, though? Because they're their own little pool off to the side. Yeah, they are. They absolutely. What survival are. games have come out of early access? Yeah, let's go that route. And Don't then starve, I guess, counts, right? Don't starve. Yeah. Okay, what first person uh, I TV want, like, okay, I'm looking for. Game. I'm looking for like a good prime example of a survival game coming out of early access that. You utilize the early access effectively, is really don't what stop. I'm yeah, don't I think start. don't I think start. Did a great job. On the list, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. might be the only one on the list. Uh... If chat, yeah, if I can't think of anything too. Yeah, and I'm more than open. Minecraft. To that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just I I haven't really been uh, convinced by a survival game yet. It it continues not to happen. For me. I think I, I think one game that will come out of early access that'll be really good will be the Long Dark because it's already really mm -hmm. good. That's probably I think, fair, yeah. I think that's going to be one that's going to be a huge success story. All right, but what about a first-person right, yeah. survival game that is multiplayer in early All right. access? <laughs> that, that, <laughs> there you go. That's I mean I think that's the the crux of, of what we're looking at here. Yeah. Because uh, the multiplayer is where you get the big box because then you get the Twitch streamers involved, mm -hmm. right? That's how it works. Yeah. My H1Z1 blew up, not because it was a good zombie survival game, it's because Battle Royale got picked up by the streamers. Yeah. And ser I'm being serious. No, like, that's I know you are. Yeah, 100%. Money. And mm -hmm. I am too, even though I'm saying it cynically and sort of sarcastically. And that's why Culling is around. They just took that <laughs> idea, made it more kind of zany and fun, and they're just like, here you go. Yeah. Which yeah, I think it works well. I know we're going to talk more about the Culling later, but I kind of like... I, I sort of see it like VR right now, where you can... It, it's so in its infancy, this... Yeah. It's a really great idea with some trappings that I find really stupid. Like, you can tell that its origins are in, like, a survival game. Yeah. It's the fact like that you... Tree. Yes, the fact that you open up most games by, if not... Bare knuckle a building, building a tree. <laughs> punching <laughs> the shit out of a tree and then just, like, bashing a stick into a rock. Oh, until it that's like... Right. That's like... Put rocks together. <laughs> <laughs> like, the idea of, like, a, a permadeath deathmatch game you only get one life and you have to like scavenge for materials is really engaging and i think the culling works but the part of it that i don't like at all is the the crafting elements that are nonsense like the the putting two uh rocks together makes a knife or it makes a, a satchel or something and i'm like man this is it's like you can tell it's got the survival game like deep in its dna Yep. It's two <laughs> yeah. sticks, and then another stick makes a bandage, then another stick makes a satchel. Oh, of course. Yeah. No, yeah, that's how that works. <laughs> and then a backpack plus a rock makes uh, armor that you can wear. And it's and like, a I get that. Plus a bomb makes a bomb. Oh, I get good, that. It's yeah. arbitrary. Like, it's, it's arbitrary, and it has to be arbitrary because otherwise it doesn't make sense. But uh, I, I wish that there was like 
some way around it. I get that there's gameplay reasons for it right now, but it's sort of silly. It's yeah. the cognitive dissonance between we're creating a reality survival game, survival as in the thing we do on Earth, with here's a bunch of arbitrary gameplay constructs that don't really make much sense unless you're very heavily invested in the concept of abstract video games. Right? Mm-hmm. So those two things don't mesh together. Because you don't do this outside and make a knife. <laughs> That's not I how it goes. You, man, but I've done that multiple times. All right. mm-hmm. well, That's worked. I shouldn't speak for all of us. I love the, uh, the parallel of like every survival game begins with you punching trees to collect wood. That's like our, our RPG yep. equivalent there would be like every sewer begins with a fight against three Giant rats. 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 Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a uh, Minecraft. It is. It's a Minecraft. They, they did a Minecraft. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's a testament to the to the quality of the gimmick in the culling mm-hmm. that you, normally that just makes me completely turn off. I'm just gonna but jump it, right into the culling here since we're sort of naturally uh, segueing there. As soon as we started that game and Nick was like, "Okay, the first thing you do is punch a tree," I was like, "He fucking <laughs> pulled the wool over my eyes." <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I thought we were gonna have something new here, but he's like, okay, first thing you do, punch a tree, and then combine that with a with a rock. I was like, oh god damn it! But I just wanted us to stay alive. I had to give you the facts immediately. <laughs> uh, all right, the, the calling, calling. Fun, man. Yeah. All right, so the calling is great. It's uh, if you don't know what the calling is, it's it's a the Hunger Games mimosa. It's Hunger uh, Games. Yeah, it's the Hunger Games. It's exactly it is. What it is. It's just the Hunger Games. Mm-hmm. Sixteen people dropped in a metal cage. Let loose in this forest with a big like stage in the center. Last one alive wins. Katniss Everdeen and... shows up. Yeah, they have muscle man milk, and you can get foreskin injections. So uh, what? That's, I, good. What, yeah, it's that's true. real. So what? Actually, yeah, that, that that actually is the main point. I think I we talked about this last week a little bit. H one Z one. Other a bunch of other games do this already. Why is the culling special? Because I think the culling takes that idea, that, that Hunger Games idea, and injects humor and zaniness and a ton of variety into it. It's not just run around, make a bow, make a bandage, find a gun, shoot guy, win. There's like drugs you inject to yourself. There's poison, people vomiting everywhere. There's fun little games that the announcer plays with you, like uh, drop three boxes, one has a gun to explode, like that kind of thing. Um, like a, 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 I forget what they call it, a death, not the death button, but there's like a button in the middle that'll show up towards the end, and it takes a long time to press it, but if you press it, all the poison canisters in the entire map go off uh, and, and cause people to kind of push to the center sooner. Like that kind of variety that ensures a very varied experience every it's single time you play. The emergent stuff. Yep, it's super after. fun. Where H1Z1 is very much the same every time. Brian, tell them about the bridge. Yeah, so apparently there's a mechanic that we didn't know about, but Nick and I got in a, a two-on-one with us as the two nice. chasing a dude down, and we had him, like, pretty low on HP. So he ran away, and he ran onto a bridge, and I chased him onto the bridge. By the way, before this, he had, like, led us on a wild goose chase, like, through his death maze of traps. <laughs> I kept like getting... Saw. <laughs> yeah, like, I got caught by his barbed wire and then, like, got out, <laughs> and then... Ran through the other door, and I was like, I swear to God, if this guy hits me with another trap, I'm going to freak out. And then instantly, like, got caught in another trap. But we, like, ran outside, and he ran across this bridge, and I chased him. And then he hit a button while I was on the bridge, and the bridge flipped, like, vertically, (laughs) and just dropped me to my death. And I was like, this, you know, they sold me right there. I was uh, running up behind, and I was like, what is happening? <laughs> that's, that's what's so much fun about it. Like, that kind of insanity injected into the style of game makes it a blast. Like, you can overlook it. He was it's... guaranteed dead, and he lived somehow because of that. Because he knew the map. He knew where the yeah. secrets were and all that other stuff. And that's, that's what's fun. And I really hope the culling introduces more maps, more gimmicks, because that's what's fun. And I, I really that enjoyed says my I time. flipped the bridge with an arrow. I don't oh, know if that's funny. true. That'd be even funnier. Um, it's all the it's the arrowers, man. It's just it's fun things like that. Like me and Dan were playing and we were chasing this guy down and he turned around and hit me with a blow dart. I was the closest one. And I'm running and now my screen's going all green. All of a sudden my guy just stops and wretches and just vomits everywhere. And uh, I lose sight of him. He murders me from afar. I'm like puking everywhere. Dan's bleeding and just like going, where is he? Where? I don't know. I don't see him. I don't know where to go. <laughs> like, God damn it, Dan. Like, come on. Uh, damn, I Danny. like that stuff. That's super yeah. fun. I, I enjoy it. Um, Nick, I like and it I, <laughs> Nick and I also had another game. Uh, and I mean, I feel bad about saying this because Vladimir Putin just said someone say something about emerging gameplay. But that's what I was just going to say. Like the game, 
does a good job of creating stories. But Nick and yeah. I lived until there were uh, six people left, so three teams of two, one of which being us, and we were in the middle, and we started getting hit, and we're like, oh, shit, there's a group here. And then we look, and there's two guys, and then Nick's like, oh, shit, one of them is a chainsaw, and he started, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he, started <laughs> he started running at us, and then we're like, oh, shit, oh, shit. And then the other guy also had a chainsaw that oh. we didn't notice. <laughs> Until just a second later. We're, we're both thinking we're dead because we've never seen chainsaws yet. I assume they're like a one-hit KO kind of thing. They, they're mm. fast. It's not one hit, but it's really quick. Well, I didn't know. It was Have you guys come across the alarm guns yet? Need, hold up. There's okay, more. sorry. <laughs> so, no. beat, the, beat the shit out of them with our reinforced baseball bats and like Lara Croft Tomb Raider axes and killed them. But nice. then we uh, we forgot to pick up their chainsaws, and like right after we killed them, like arrows started flying by our heads, and then we got killed. But well, we made the it. The arrow shooter thing. killed the chainsaw guy that I was trying to kill, uh -huh. and I was too panicked by trying to bandage myself to be able to free an inventory slot to pick up a rifle that I found on the ground. Otherwise, we could have turned the whole shit around. But it was very exciting, and I can't believe we lived through that. That's yeah, it was fun. Awesome. There's a gun as an alarm gun. Doesn't do any damage, or at least very minimal damage when you hit somebody with it. But what it does is it activates like your inner, like it malfunctions like your inner computer chip that apparently you have in you. And so oh. for two minutes, you're blinking like like huge bright lights and there's like a loud noise coming out of you that sounds like an alarm. <laughs> and every few seconds, the guy will be like, please remain patient as your whatever computer system resets itself. Don't alarm anybody nearby or you may die. And then it just like That's keeps awesome. going. It's just two minutes of basically giving away your position. So yeah. you just shoot the guy with it. You know, all right, good, good luck not getting killed by someone. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's clever. That's great. It's good. That's oh. what that that's that stuff that I really like about the game. Mm -hmm. So overall, we're uh, we've got this, this explains maybe the the reticence to jump into the all these survival games are a cesspool of shit argument. Like clearly, <laughs> you guys had a pretty good time with the going then. Yeah, I think it would be better without the uh, crafting elements. Like I, I find that yeah. kind of annoying. They like, can make that yeah not necessary. I just don't know how they would do it. I mean that's the thing is like it's a really easy way to allow like a spectrum of gameplay strategies. Like, you could focus on looting, or you can take a little extra time and, like, craft bandages and, like, get yourself completely prepared, but at the expense of having other people probably loot stuff before you. So, it, it's a little bit of a problem, I guess. Uh, did you just show the video in the background did, of the yeah, bridge flipping? <laughs> people are like, it's nice. Nick's arrow. <laughs> yeah. Nick's the traitor. Um, Look, man, I didn't do it intentionally. If I did, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I'm you, not were you were thinning out. You were thinning out the herd, man. Apparently, if if I did do it, then that's kind of hilarious and unintentionally. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of think it would be cool if instead of crafting elements, everybody got like a backpack that just had two items in it, and oh, then like the Hunger Games. Th that would be beautiful. <laughs> well, there's, then, there's perks though. You might be able to do that. Yeah, I mean maybe, but I don't know. But uh, or it would be cool if you started like Hunger Games style, and there were like. 12 people and then like eight backpacks in the middle or something like yeah. that that could that could have random loot and then everybody else could run into the forest or something but like the idea the emergent gameplay of it is cool starting every run by being like okay i need to like punch a tree is a yeah, little yeah. shitty mm. yeah. and especially like when you use a bandage and then you're like okay that was cool combat now let me punch a tree for about forty-five seconds, so I can craft another bandage to get ready for the next encounter. Mm. Like that stuff, I think is a, a pretty thin gameplay conceit that I don't really like. But I like the rest of the game more than enough to uh, to to enjoy that. I think it's a new style of like multiplayer game, which is what yeah. I like. It's got a, it's got a lot of novelty for me right now. Awesome. I really hope they open up the party system to allow us to have a full group yeah. of of eight people all queuing together. I would love to see a huge map that supports that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Knowing all the people involved and knowing who they are and what they're up to makes it so much more interesting than just killing yeah. random people or just dying out of the blue to someone you don't know. Right. And, and one, one little simple change that I really like that they made between like H1Z1 and stuff is actually the simplistic inventory system where you're only allowed to carry like four items. Uh, a lot of the problems with, like, uh, Arma, for example, the Arma version is, like, you're constantly managing your backpack, what you have in it, all the stuff you're carrying. Well, this is, like, you have to make decisions on the fly in the culling. Do I want this spear or do I want to take this knife, oh, which is shorter range and more me. damage? <laughs> yeah. When uh, I was trying well, to pick up that rifle, I had no slots left, so I just died. Yeah. Mm. You could, uh, did you know you can just hurl items, like, just toss it, get rid of it? 
Yeah, but I was still in such an infancy of learning the controls that it all yeah. happened too fast for me to know what yeah, I was yeah, doing. Yeah, that makes sense. But I think that that small aspect also keeps the action flowing. They 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 made it so there's a very the only downtime in the calling is really the crafting. There's no in, not a whole lot of inventory management and that kind of thing. So I think it's smart. I like it a lot. Good. I kind of feel like I would like it better if you just started with a knife and a bandage. Yeah, that's that's the only thing. Is like I mean, to be fair. They're making the game, and they got a lot of data of, of people playing it. There's probably like 30,000 people playing it at any given time, right? And they can watch Twitch streamers play it and see the interaction there in between chat as well. But for me personally, I think if you just started every run focused on looting instead because you already had like a knife and a bandage, or even like a stick and a bandage, I'd be into it. Because otherwise... At some point, you're going to be like, okay, let me take two minutes to make a bandage. Which is not necessarily bad, but it, I find it kind of boring. You want to keep the action going. People yeah. are saying maybe like a class system. Uh, Calling already is like takes a step to that because you get to customize your character. You have like, what, three or four perks that you get to... Three. Yeah, three perks that you get to customize, which do certain things. More damage, run faster, more stamina, that kind of thing. Um, but that might be a good idea too, like a class system that you, instead of like crafting you start with certain gear per class be interesting but i feel like a lot of people be like well this is op the optimal class no matter what you do yeah. yeah maybe it was just that there's a like a specific perk that gives you plus to a certain class of damage but i thought there was something that gives you preference towards say if you got a helicopter is. drop you will always get a certain weapon out of it you can uh, which... customize the drops yeah that you get so how about this they just start you out with 50 uh funk and then you can immediately call in a helicopter drop and get the weapon of your choice but you got to go mm. find the pad to some extent, I don't like that just because I like that at the end of our game, we, uh, we're still using, like, baseball bats against right. chainsaws instead of just, like, maybe two minutes in, somebody has, like, an AK-47 or something. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Interesting. Yeah. There we go. The calling. It is uh, 20 bucks, I want to say, on Steam right now. I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, available now if you're looking for it. Get into that Mosa genre, baby. It's blowing up. Oh, it's uh, 15 bucks. Sorry, yeah, fourteen ninety nine on Steam. Which is pretty cheap, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a good price. Considering the online actually works and is very robust. Although, yeah, as, no as, problems queuing. Yeah, as Nick mentioned, like, uh, it does suck that you can't queue with more than two people. Like, it would be cool if you could have just, like, 5v5 or something like that. But hey, at what point does that become, like, like Arc Counter-Strike, I guess, oh. or Rust Counter-Strike? Yeah, but, I'm... I just want it to be lots of teams of two. Like, if you could queue with oh, six of your other yeah. friends, and they're all in groups of two. Oh, do, like, just... a private game kind of thing. Exactly, yeah. yeah. That would be oh, cool. I would love that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All I right. think they're planning it, but I don't know. I hope they are, yeah. Dude, Let's... that would be so cool for, like, uh, if we could get a group of ten people together. for Tournament of Shame, man? Oh, too. yeah, there you go. Yeah, like we that. literally Great kill each other. <laughs> 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 the final Tournament of Shame, and there's only yeah. one survivor. All right, the calling. There we go. Okay, time to turn on the spoiler button. Boop. Spoilers are happening now. Uh, we're going to be talking about XCOM 2, which has now right. been out for nearly two months, so sufficient time to be spoiled. Uh, Ryan and Mathis, I think, are going to primarily be handling the discussion here. The XCOM 2's final mission, which doesn't sound like uh, was uh, didn't exactly live up to the rest of the game, it sounds like. Just go out on a limb and say it's fucking right back. Trash. Oh, damn, there we go. Okay, good start. Uh, Spoilers. Uh, well, Spoilers, you are right? like, Spoilers are sure, happening. Spoilers are happening, by the way, yes. We're talking about the final mission. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, in my final episode, I, I think the last two or three minutes I just talked about how I thought it was poor design. Uh, I think it was a poorly designed final level. Um, and my argument is because it is a level that goes completely against the way the game teaches you to play. And a lot of people are like, well, that's not, that's not bad design. That just, it's, it's trying to be different. But my argument is if you play for 40 hours and the whole game is teaching you to play a very particular way and then it changes that on you on the very last mission, a mission that lasts one and a half to two hours long, that is, it doesn't matter if it functions properly, if it's working, that is inherently bad design. Yeah. I mean, for people who don't know, basically, the most XCOM missions are, like, you are going to have 10 to, well, I guess, like, 6 to 
20 enemies, and it's kind of designed around that fact that you both have, like, limited numbers. But the final mission, you fight, like, 20 dudes, maybe, and then in the final room, you could fight anywhere from, like, 15 to infinity, I guess. Some people are saying that it has, like, infinitely spawning waves, or at least did before the most recent patch. And you have an objective, basically, which is to kill three VIP units, for lack of a better word. And it oh, just, man. like... Those enemies are fucking powerful. <laughs> they're, they're the most powerful enemy in the game. Yeah. And you have it, three it of them completely, on the field. It completely changes the way that the game is played, and kind of, like, forces you to, I guess, most people, what they do is they just hunker down and try to, like, cheese the game and force the AI to come to them. Um... It, it's also like a little a little buggy, if that makes sense. Like you can't really fire grenades in the final room, which are a huge crutch in XCOM that you use for like the entire game. And um, there's there's so many like mind control units that you're probably going to end up losing your squad, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, lo- losing a lot of your squad, or at least losing their functionality temporarily. And it's really like the the reason I have a problem with it, even though I think that XCOM is an amazing game, or yeah, XCOM 2 is me, an amazing game. I want to say that with you. Like, I think that no matter what we say about the final mission, I really put this game such a... It was so good all the way through. It was a very good yeah. game. No, I think, I think XCOM 2 is really, really good. And it's going to get better. Like, XCOM Enemy Within is a better game than it's ever been because of patches and, you know, the Enemy Within expansion and stuff like that that's come out. But uh, at the same time, like, this final mission, I feel like it needs to be reworked in the sense that it just completely... Well, first off, like, the last mission is really, really hard, which is not a problem. Right. But every mission every mission that precedes it is really easy, especially the mission that directly precedes it. Only has, like, six <laughs> yeah. enemies, and it's, like, ten minutes long. And then uh, the final mission is also way, way longer than any other mission in the game, even yeah. the other story missions, which is it kind of like it, it feels like they pull the, the wool out from under you, I suppose. Like there's a, it, it feels like in a way they're kind of like, ha, we tricked you. Yeah, it, it comes across almost as though they just didn't have, and I, I don't think this is the case, but it's like it almost comes across like, shit, we don't have time. We have to make this level hard let's just infinitely spawn enemies every turn and, uh, and and crush them, you know, with with a waves and waves and waves of enemy. And the problem is, too, it's like, the way to beat that mission is one of two ways. You get very fucking lucky, or you cheese the shit out of it, which is how I ended up beating it. Yeah. Because it, go, it basically goes into this one big room, which has a big wall there. So you have to go into one of two choke points to even get into that room. And there's no reason you would think not to go into that room. You're like, all right, this is where the final battle's happening. I'm going to take advantage of it. You quickly realize that if you go into that room, you will become surrounded because on each side of that room, there are three portals on each side, so six portals total. And at any any time, on any turn, one of those portals can activate and spawn a random bunch of enemies. And you are quickly outflanked in that room. Like, going into that room is a death trap. It is not where you want to go. Couple that with the fact that the three enemies you are trying to kill possess the abilities, all three of them, to do a huge AoE that'll do a ton of damage to your troops, mind control your units, and every time that you hit them, doesn't matter when, they randomly teleport somewhere in that room on the map. So you kind of have to get lucky because you have to kill those guys, and every time you hit them, you kind of have to cross your fingers and go, RNG, please don't teleport them on the, on the other side of the map past like four pods of enemies, and a ton of cover, because that can totally, totally fuck you. And on my playthrough, I had two or three pods of codexes spawn, which, in a codex enemy, every time you hit a codex enemy, unless you have a flashbang, which, as Ryan said, using grenades in this map is fucking nearly impossible, uh, they clone themselves. So I had these enemies that were cloning themselves. I had dealing with, like, 20 to 30 enemies on screen at any given time, which the game cannot handle. It, like, falls to, like, 10 to 15 frames a second. Um, and it just forces you to to just have to go... Like, it just, it just crushes you under its unfair difficulty. It is an unfair, poorly designed mission in a game that really... It, it kind of hinges itself on, on good strategy and, and smart decisions. And there's really none of that in the final mission. <laughs> yeah, I really... Uh, there's, there's a good point in there, which is, like, when the mission spawned, like, 20 enemies... I, it, the game ran at like 10 frames per second and I was like well if this is like the design for the final mission 
why can't the game handle it? Like yeah. you would think they would have probably, you know, play tested that specifically, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Like. I'm not, I'm not saying that that means that it's a bad design decision necessarily, but at the same time, it's just like the game can't handle this. So, like, I, yeah. I feel like maybe you should have worked around it a little bit. Um, but I I don't know. Like, for me, it was just like it seemed like it wasn't XCOM anymore. Like, it seemed like it almost became like a, like a tower defense game. Like you said, you could either so get weird. really lucky, which is yeah. what I did. I effectively just got super uh, lucky, yeah. and with one of my last units, uh, I managed to mind control a gatekeeper, and then missed about like several shots above sixty percent in a row. Let's put it. Oh that yeah, <laughs> that's but, awesome. But with the final shot, I uh, I managed to make it happen. I guess by definition, it has to be the final shot. But um, or you can camp outside of the room, and if you camp outside of the room, it's basically. It's it. Not fun. XCOM Two rewards aggr- aggression for the entire game, and then the last mission is like, "Hey, hang back and hunker." Like it's XCOM Enemy Within. Yeah. So if you have like XCOM Two, most of the missions, the way they put urgency in in the, in the sequel is like every mission, almost every mission, ninety percent of them have a turn timer. You have twelve turns, eight turns, whatever, to complete the mission, and then you either fail or you are now like your objective is fails, and you have a secondary objective you now have to complete. The final mission is the complete opposite of that. Um, the way I beat it was, after I lost, I spent two hours, lost the mission, had to reload, had to do it all over again, wanted to kill myself. Went to the, to the main room, lined up all my soldiers on, outside the doorway in, uh, of that main room, sent one person in, activated the pod, ran all the way out, overwatched everybody, and waited for that pod with the avatar to come close shot the avatar when I had the opportunity to, and then crossed my fingers, the avatar didn't teleport on the other side of the wall, and uh, have to wait for them all over again. Because The other thing that the final mission does too, it's like, okay, you have to kill three avatars. You almost feel like you have to rush the avatars down because they're so powerful. Because if you wait too long, the other avatars show up, and now you're dealing with three mind controlling enemies. But you get punished for trying to rush the avatar down because you just get overwhelmed by regular enemies if you try. So... Yeah, I just sat outside the room, sent in somebody, aggroed them, sat outside the room, overwatched, and waited the whole freaking time. It was boring. It was awful. Mm. It was just poorly, poorly done. Also, yeah, it's, it's, when grenades don't work, you're right. Like, controlling pods is, is fucking impossible. Gr- grenades are such a, cr- I guess, crutch in this game because they're so good. They're so good. And, uh,. You can't use them in the, like you can barely use them in the final mission. And another item that is never used in the game is almost necessary in this one: mind shields. The, oh, the mind shield, yeah. You, like I got lucky because I would the way I didn't bring any mind shields. What I did was on the second playthrough, uh, I just kept everybody within the aura of my psi operative who negated all mind effects. So that's how I kept them safe on my on the winning run. Ugh, it was just the most frustrating experience. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, that's basically, yeah, I don't want to, like, belabor the point too much. But I I would have preferred a, a final mission, I guess, that was, like, just... It's hard to say, because, I, I mean, one of the big problems with uh, XCOM Enemy Within is that the Temple Ship Assault, which is the final mission in that, is too easy. Like, yeah. when you when you pop the final room, there's three enemy or there's one enemy you have to kill, and that's it. So all you have to do is, like, if you shoot him with a rocket... And then, like, hit him with your sniper twice. He's dead. And that's the end of the game. So it seems, like, super anticlimactic. But at the same time, I think it was kind of handled in the other way. Or in, in the opposite way, which I don't necessarily really like either. What I would have preferred, and I have no idea if this would have actually worked, but it sounds cool, is what if instead of fighting 50 enemies, they had, like, one super ethereal or something like that that had, like, yeah. 150 HP. And then, you know, maybe he has the ability to spawn some units. Maybe he has, like, super psionic or, like, AoE abilities that do a lot of damage. But you're fighting, like, one really tough alien, yeah. which is something that the game never did. Like, throwing a lot yep. of enemies at you is, is an obvious approach as well. But I think it would be really cool if there was, like, one uber alien that My- was, like, five times harder than a sectopod or something. I was thinking that. And the other thing I was thinking is, like, keep the three avatar thing. But spawn him in, like, two or three pods, deal with them, then another pod spawns. Or 
if you kill the avatar, that'll trigger the next uh, like so he like avatar spawns with his pod plus two pods. If you kill the avatar, the next avatar pod plus two pods spawn. But or you then you would have to try and like prioritize. Do you want to kill the avatar fast or do you want to kill all the ads that come fast? Like you still do wave based combat, but in a structured manner that doesn't kill the game's FPS because it's poorly optimized. It doesn't feel like it's just throwing a hundred enemies at you and saying good luck. You know, like so you could still maybe do it in a way that that makes sense. It's still difficult, but re- rewards strategy as opposed to just hoping luck and patience pays off. So final verdicts. Overall, just a huge disappointment, but the game is still quite good. Sounds like. Yeah. Yep. Game yeah. is excellent. Final mission is trash. Yeah. XCOM Two is a, is a genuine game of the year candidate. I yes. feel even though it's early, but. Um, I, I feel like the the final mission just it taints the experience a little bit, but I, I still like quite enjoy the game, and I'm looking forward to playing it uh, when the new, assuming it's story DLC. I'm looking forward to playing it when that comes out because you know these games they have like a, a huge long tail, and the the fact that it's not necessarily 100% what I want it to be right now doesn't mean it won't you know get there at some point in the future. Right. Mm-hmm. That's the positive spin to the. Uh... The future we live in where people are free to patch games on the fly, right? We always look at the cynical side of, well, people are always just releasing these unfinished games now. But then when we focus on it a little bit more, we see that there's actually been quite a few examples of people, you know, just like making good by their fans. You know, just like changing things that they may not have even necessarily considered in the original design process. And then with the feedback of thousands of people, they're like, oh, well, you know, maybe that uh, was a pretty glaring oversight on our part. So, you know, that's always nice. So, yeah. Ryan, I just want to make it public. I apologize for spoiling everything for you. That that pissed me off too. <laughs> people acting like people oh. like Matt, what Matt has told me about gatekeepers was basically they're, they're hard. Yeah, they're hard and they have a lot of HP. And then um, when I found a gatekeeper, I was like, well, I'm gonna do the same thing I do for every other hard enemy and just put it in stasis and then shoot the shit out of it when it comes out of stasis. And people were like, wow, way to go, Matt has spoiled it. It was obvious. <laughs> Obviously, if you had just encountered this enemy that had 50 HP randomly, what you totally would have done was just, like, ignore it and assume that it's going to be, like, a, a <laughs> your friend or something like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> would have been nice if Mathis could have let Northern Lion play through the game for himself. <laughs> God, I was like, you guys are fucking idiots. All right, can we... <laughs> Before we Nick. just call everyone fucking idiots, can we get out of spoiler Nick. zone real quick? Okay, here we go. Come on back, yeah. Nick. You're good. How was it? Did you miss us? Yeah, I missed you a lot. Yeah. And I hope it wasn't disrespectful. I just didn't want to have that spoiled because I'm no, sure no, no, I'm going to no. get there myself. Yeah, we spent most of the time talking about how much Varaxis sucks balls. <laughs> oh. Yeah, basically. Okay, uh, <laughs> Nick, you want to talk about Shellshock Live? Yeah, I love that game. Mm-hmm. No, you have do. We all played it by now? Has Mathis played it? I, I have so. not played it. No, okay. You're missing out, buddy. You got to hear it. I hear it's Shell amazing. Shock. Tell me about Shellshock. It's such. It's a simple, simple game. We've been playing it for years in a bunch of different forms, but I feel like this is the definitive iteration of the uh, tanks that roll to slightly different positions, then pick their velocity and shoot a bullet of various types at enemies and trying to be the uh, the last one alive. It's got great multiplayer. It's got about 250 unlockable weapons. Uh, it's got a leveling system and skill trees, customizable tanks, uh, great multiplayer. It's really addictive and perfect for streaming, as it turns out. Uh, as you can do like 2v2, 3v3, 4v4, 1v1, whatever you want to do. Or you just do free-for-all and blow everything up. Mm-hmm. So I've been obsessed with it lately, just unlocking stuff, trying to get to that level 100 when you get all the weapons. Um, well, Ryan's probably going to bring it up, but you know the balancing uh, when you bring in a new person, probably not the most desirable thing. It would be kind of neat to turn off the weapon upgrades and the skill trees maybe for that situation. Uh, but if you're all grouping together and playing through the game going up, a lot of fun. Game is really good if you're into that kind of like worms style combat. It's more like Scorched Earth or, or Pocket Tanks, but like yeah. it's, Worms is. Tanks, yeah. It's not an unfair thing to say that it's like Worms in the sense that it's like ballistics based, physics based combat, I guess. But the the leveling system is done moronically from a competitive standpoint, and I don't mean that to be rude, but the fact that a player who has played for 10 hours has better starting stats 
than a player who has played for one hour and also has the skill to have played more about it or to, to play more of it to begin with. It's like, imagine if you were playing like Street Fighter 4 online for the first time and you're like, okay, it's Ryu versus Ryu, but this Ryu is a dude who has 100 hours. He's played uh, enough to get double his HP and all of his attacks do more damage. Right. Like, it, it's such an enormous handicap that if you haven't played enough to like even be comparable to the people you're playing against, you're like, why even try? Like it would take like a colossal fuck up for them to not be able to kill you, basically, because you're starting at such a huge disadvantage. There's random elements to it too, because the the way that the game works is you get this weapon pool that's slowly but surely increasing the more you play, and it picks a set of like I don't know between eight and twelve weapons or something like that to start off with. And when you start, yeah, your weapons are pretty janky. They don't do a lot of damage. Uh, but through shooting them and getting hits with them, you accrue XP for all the weapons, which then upgrades them to be better. And in addition to that, you're upgrading and adding more weapons to your weapon pool, which can then be drawn upon later in future games. So in maybe about three or four hours, you're going to have a, a set of better weapons that you can play with. You can also play offline and get some XP that way, which will increase your weapon pool too. And in just a short amount of time, you'll have a little bit of more of a competitive edge Granted, it's still a bit weighted towards the favor of the people who played more, uh, specifically with regard to the adding your armor, which you can add up to 80 more armor onto the starting whatever amount of health. And you can which set is that to 100, so... Well, you can set it depending yeah. on the game, but it's, it's right. 100, 200, 300, 400, whatever you want it to be. Um, I tend to play 200 often, but yeah, I'm open to whatever. So, it sounds um, weird. Why, why have a leveling system in that type of game, though? Because it sounds like a party you game. you powerful. Like, when you've played it, it makes you feel really good because you're shooting really powerful shit at people who can't help themselves as much. So when you're on the top, it feels great. Yeah, of course, but then you're making it not fun for everybody else, though, right? I mean, it sounds like this is a party game that you would play with mostly your friends. Well, the idea is you would queue up with people who are roughly around your level, and there's a setting that lets you pick people around that level. You can set it to 10, 20, 50, whatever levels you want to go within. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Yeah, playing with a group when you're all different levels, it doesn't work great. I, I agree with that. I will say, like, it has a ton of, uh, like, it has a big online community. So when I was doing my video, I was able to, like, match up against people who were comparable levels really, really easily. But at the same time, it is frustrating to be like, okay, I'm going to, like, play this game. Literally, unless I grind off camera for, like, 10 hours, I have probably less than a 25% chance of winning each game. Two ways to get around it. You can do 4v4 games, which also buff your XP gain uh, and diffuse the amount that you're at a disadvantage because you've got three other people potentially higher level than you. And you can play offline, which can quickly add to your weapon I, pool and XP. I, I did the campaign. I played like an hour of the campaign. I gained like six levels. Mm-hmm. Which is like, I, I'm not just not willing to put in the, the time necessary to get there, I guess. And I think, it, I'm not trying to make a point that it's objectively bad, but I think that there is a design issue with the game because when I go to the lobby for Shellshock Live, there's all these games that are like, we're grinding XP. Just everybody come and get to the middle. We're going to finish the game as fast as possible so we can get the highest XP multiplier. Like, that to me says, like, this is a system that a lot of people have a sure. problem with. It's the dark underbelly of that situation, the way they structured it. But if you're playing it sort of casually, just with a, a group of people who are also in the same general vicinity as you, it's it's quite a bit of fun, and you don't concern yourself with that. It's just unfortunate that you're coming in sort of after the fact and have a lower level generally. I hope we can get you up to be where we are. I, if if you guys keep playing, there's no way I'm going to catch up, which is fine. <laughs> I just I just wish there was... Uh, I, I wish it handled it the way that Cannon Brawl handles it, where... You play and you get experience and you unlock new weapons and new characters and then that gives you a more diverse pool of weapons to pull from so that you can pull the strategies that you actually want. But what the game is focused around more is we give you random weapons every time so you never know what you're going to get. That's kind of a cool approach, but at the same time, if all of my weapons are level 1 and all of the enemies are level 3 and they start with double the HP or at least 50% more HP than I have, it's like... I mean, it, it's it's the strangest multiplayer way to handle that game because I don't want to play with my friends because my friends are like, I can't beat them. It's um, unless they have. I, yeah, I got I got gotcha. you. I just hate that that's becoming the prevailing narrative is like this game sucks so much because I'm playing with people higher level than me. Because if you weren't playing with us, you'd have a totally different experience. That's the only thing about it. I, I agree, but I think it's it's enough that it gives me pause. But I posted my let's look at it the game today, and I like it. I do like it a lot. 
but at the same time, the the balance is really, really annoying. Like well, for me, like this is the, this is the type of game I would only really want to play with friends. And if, if my friends are so beyond me that it's not even possible, I will probably never want to play it. Yeah, I kind it's of agree. It's just once with that. you get out of the lowest, like once you're out of the basement, then all of a sudden there's enough options that you don't feel stifled anymore. How long but, does it take to get out of the basement? Is the question. I don't know, like five or ten hours. Too much time. It's a big I, commitment. I it's yeah. really addictive, though. It is it's so addictive. Yeah. I don't think it's five. Like I've got like three in it, and I'm still getting my ass kicked by people. Like Austin joined my game. And when I had like three hours, and it, it wasn't even close. It was like flyweight versus a heavyweight. Like right. what I, the what I want to equate it to is like Magic: The Gathering. If like one person was running like a deck that was only commons, and the other person was running like a tier one standard deck, it's like you do still literally have a chance to win. But the table is so heavily stacked in the other person's favor that at some point you're like, why would I even want to? It's like play. Well, it's I'd rather play someone on an even playing field. It's weird that the progression system is 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 all based on like getting more powerful as opposed to something fun. Like, uh, you know, maybe like you said, opening a more ver- a more variety of weapons as opposed to making yeah, weapons more powerful. I, like that, I there think is. was my well, There's yeah, variety. that exists, right? Yeah, exactly. Like that, you unlock more weapons as but you only go. that. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like mm-hmm. only that. Um, or or cosmetic stuff, or just having like you said earlier. Why don't they just have the option to turn it off? If you want See, to play that, with friends. If, yeah. if they had, like, levels on bound option and then a levels bound option. And they do have, like, you can restrict your lobby so only people within a certain amount of, of levels can get in with you. But, like, if they had, like, a balanced option where it's, like, all weapons yeah. are the same level. That would, yeah. that would be that. Do that. Like, yeah. keep, keep the powerful progression system. But for fun friend time where you want to, like, stream or just play with friends for fun, just turn that off so it's a fair game all the way through. I think uh, I feel like that's easy. Nick's argument, though, that like uh, you know, on the on the other side of that argument, we have to consider that the people that are leveling up and investing more time into into it, they do get that true sense of satisfaction of oh yeah, I am actually becoming stronger. But in a game like this, I mean, in a multiplayer game, that's just it's such a delicate balance there because you you just have to consider so many different people's approaches to it. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to be turned off by that because they'll hop into multiplayer a couple of times. And even if, you know, like you impose the level limits, it's still more than likely you're going to run into somebody who's a higher level than you when you're just starting out, right? So no, I, you set it to 10 and everyone's within 10 levels and you're not going to have that problem. Or if you're making a game of five people or six people who are all the same level as you are starting, it's it's just fun. So you don't, you don't think just, it's we like... We never as, had as, this concern. Yeah, you don't think it's as big of an issue then, I guess. No, not really. I, no. I think the game is just fun and really addictive, and I'm I didn't take it that seriously anyway. And even mm-hmm. if I was getting beaten, I'm still getting XP from it anyway. It's not the losing or winning aspect of it. It's that the person, if if someone's level fifty and someone's level one, there should be enough of a skill difference that the person at level fifty, just due to practice, should win like eighty percent of the time. Yeah. But then yeah. to also weight the table so heavily that they're they have like almost maybe like 30% more HP and all their guns do more damage. And instead of shooting one grenade, every time you shoot a grenade, it shoots like five. Semi-related like, note, you know how like in Counter-Strike they have aim bots and stuff? In this, are there like protractor bots in this sort of genre? Like when you <laughs> they have like bots that'll mathematically project your shots to 100% accuracy? When you Google Shellshock Live, like the second Google autocomplete is like Shellshock Live hacks. Oh, but no. <laughs> I, I don't know if there's a, if they actually <laughs> exist, as you can tell from my performance on the NLSS. <laughs> That's funny. It's a cheap game. It's not something to be taken that seriously. It's yeah. just a fun little addictive game to play with your friends, and it just happens to really suit what I like to do anyway, which is just have fun, be silly, and, and you can stream it really well, and it's perfect. Yeah. Have viewers in. Everybody has a good time. I just, I don't know. I didn't think that hard about it. It was just sort of an easy one for me. I agree. No, I, I mean, I get that. I, I get that. But at the same time, you, if you're the same level as the most people, like most people you play against, like you're within yeah. like 15 of, of everybody that you play against to be like super low. Basically, I'm signing on to basically be like, OK, I'm going to get my ass kicked for like 10 hours so I can have a 50 percent chance of, of playing well against my friends when I could just be doing other stuff. Yeah. I don't disagree that it could be balanced better. I just think that that shouldn't be the way that the game is looked upon when people yeah. are thinking about playing it. 
in my let's look at i'm i'm positive about the game i literally say explicitly i think it's worth playing in spite of the balance issues especially if you can play with friends who are around the same level and putting in the same investment as you yeah i think but, like the caveat here that we should project is that like it's it's a great party game if you pick it up with a bunch of people and you all start out at the same time you're gonna have a great time with it i think like it's only uh yeah. Uh, it's only seven bucks for a single copy of the game, but there's a twenty dollar four pack for the game as well. So there's a good purchase option there. Uh, yeah, I, I I like it too. I think it's really solid. Just a just a fun like this. This feels like the kind of game that you would play uh, during like free period at school, right? Like this is the thing that you you go to some empty computer room and a, a bunch of people are playing Shell Shock Live. I'll tell you one thing. Now that I know that's how the progression system works. That ain't being a tournament of shame game. Dude, that's kind of where I was coming at it from my perspective. No way. It's like, I, I thought Dan had a different angle on it than I even understood because I didn't see how he was going to make that yeah, work. It doesn't figure not, that out, yeah. Look, if people agree to do like a tournament of shame for it, I'm not going to be a stick in the mud. But like, be me, Matt, so fast. me, Mathis, and Dan are playing for fourth, basically. <laughs> Un unless I spend like like 10 hours this weekend yeah. getting to a yeah, competitive yeah. level. Yeah, I would have to really, really screw up to lose that one. Yeah, hmm. I think. Okay, it's Shell Shock Live, seven bucks. Bill on Steam came out March eleventh. Made by who, who developed that? It's a K Champ, K Champ Games. They they made anything else of note? I don't think so. Yeah, that might be their only one. K Champ. Yeah. Shell Shock be recorded. Yep. I feel like K Champ it sounds like an emote that Kate needs. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. All right, uh, the final game in our docket today is Deadbolt. Ryan, you want to talk about Deadbolt? Yeah, Deadbolt is a Hotline miami s game from the creators of Risk of Rain. So basically you enter a building and kill everyone inside of the building using weapons that you start with and also loot that you pick up from inside of the building. Each level is kind of its own self-contained, standalone little action puzzle going on, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty good. That's sort it of a pretty good. gunpoint vibe i'm getting here graphically plus hotline miami mm -hmm. it's way more hotline miami than gunpoint um it's really fucking hard the way the systems work though yeah. it's a bit gunpointy it's really hard i'll put it that way uh the game is is gonna smack you in the face over and over and over again the first batch of levels you're dealing with like a zombie like drug ring essentially so the idea is you're you're the grim reaper and you're going to kill like zombies and undead that have not died, and you're going to take them out. Um, so the uh, the first batch of levels is all about zombies, and towards the end it gets hard as they introduce some interesting zombie enemies where like the bodies are separated from the heads, and the heads are looking one way, and you can kill like shoot the heads and the body will die. It's it's in it's interesting, but the next set of levels is where I'm I'm at, and it's all vampires, and the vampires are fucking hard. Uh, Zombies are slow and they have guns and they're pretty simple. Vampires, there's like girl vampires that are super fast and will melee you and kill you in an innocent shot. Guy vampires have guns and they will just, they have incredible aim and they'll just shoot you one shot. They're, they can be on the roof. They, there's a ton of them. Um, they're all really fast and you really need to, you, will, you die in one hit no matter what. You need, to, uh, you need to get through the level and you need to kind of like plan out your route really well. Otherwise you get your ass kicked. I, like, by the end of the first section of the game, the first act, which is where I still am, I was like, this game is a little bit too hard for me. Like, I, if I wanted to put in more time, I, I could get around it, I'm sure. But uh, I was getting to the point where I was like, each level's taking me, like, ten minutes of retrying and dying, which mm -hmm. is fine. But I was like, this is a good game that I am probably not going to play more of just due to the difficulty. Especially with the knowledge that you gave me that uh, it just becomes, like, substantially more difficult after that point. I feel like I need to, I don't know if it's possible, I think it is, I feel like I need to grind out some of the earlier levels for souls so I can use mm -hmm. those to buy better guns. Because the guns that I have now, and the secondary item I have now, got me through the first level of the vampires, and it can get me about two-thirds the way of the other level, and then I'm, I'm scrambling to get guns off of the enemies, but the problem is getting close to them is impossible. And there's some cool el elements to introduce to levels like dancing vampires will not attack you, unless you attack them first. So you can kind of like, there's like one vampire in a room that has a gun and will attack you on sight that's surrounded by a bunch of dancing vampires. Mm. Can I lure him out of that room into another room without causing issues? Or do I take him out and risk 
like angering the entire room of vampires to chase me down and basically kill me. Um, I feel like if I had better guns, I could do that level easier. But right now, with my current layout, it's it's fucking it's difficult. It's impossible for me. I'm not good enough, basically. <laughs> Just coming clean on it, right? Yeah, it's it's hard. It's really really hard. But it's it's well done. It's it's well designed. It works well. It's a good game. If you like that style of game, like a Hotline Miami type game, I sug- I would recommend it. Mm-hmm. It's really good. We we talked about not a hero on the show probably mm-hmm. like a year ago, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And it is basically not a hero, but the tone is much different. And also, I like it a lot better. Like not a hero is not a big fan of this. I'm actually like I could see myself actually beating the whole game. If maybe it came out during a during a time where I was more focused on it, maybe. But uh, I, I think it's really good. I actually might like it more than Risk of Rain, uh, their last I, game. Yeah, I was gonna say we gotta mention this is the uh, the next <laughs> entry from the Risk of Rain developers. And uh, I, I do like those kind of games that are basically like one hit and you're you're done. Like yeah, even even Hotline Miami too, I quite liked. But uh, at the same time, you know the difficulty is there. Not necessarily a bad thing. Probably a good thing in a game where. After an hour, I was 24% complete. So um, I, I can understand that. And it's pretty cheap, too. It's 10 bucks. Like, yep. it, it maybe sounds a little bit like, uh, I don't want to say offensive to other developers, but, you know, Risk of Rain, I think, was a huge success, but they didn't get, like, too big for their britches and say, like, our next game is going to be 20 bucks. Mm-hmm. This is, like, a reasonably priced game that is, I, like, its value is right around where I would judge it at. So, Awesome. Yeah, it's good. All right. Deadbolt, as he said, ten bucks available on Steam right now. Uh, I I think I'm going to save our final story here uh, for next week as it is sort of a developing thing, so we'll hold off on the okay. the PlayStation 4.5 rumors because that's a that's a pretty meaty discussion I think oh, there too. Okay. So mm-hmm. we'll uh, we'll save that for another show. So sorry if you were looking forward to that one. Uh, for now, I think it's time we move on to everybody's favorite segment. Let's ask Roundtable. And, uh, oh, wait a minute. We don't have Ask Roundtable this week, do we? I was going to say, what was the question? No, I yeah. Time yeah. <laughs> uh, to get one on the fly. Yeah, sure. Fuck it. Uh, every week, usually before the show, uh, people send in questions to roundtableyt at gmail.com. I'll be honest, I completely spaced this today. So we're, uh, we're just going to fly by the seat of our pants here. That's not the one. That was the last one. Uh, so every week, people send in uh, questions to roundtableyt at gmail.com. We do our best to answer those questions. Uh, this week's question is going to come... Well, let's, uh, let's have a look here. Let's have a look here. Who's got a question? Who's got a question? This is a, this is a ridiculous proposition, man. <laughs> what? This is, no, just the, what I'm doing right now is the most ridiculous thing. Oh. What is Chad has one. Um, oh, does Chad have one? Boxers or briefs? Boxers or briefs? Boxer briefs. Uh, I'm gonna go boxers. boxer briefs. Yeah, boxers, boxers. is mine. I guess yeah, you're too. like 14 years old. You're wearing boxers. What's wrong with you boxers, man? Yeah, what? what you gotta let your shit breathe. What's I mean, they breathe in boxer briefs. That's yeah, constricting. It's not constricting it's at constricting. all, man. It, it makes me feel like briefs I'm suffocating, are, man. Briefs are constricting. No, mm-hmm. boxers. I there's that Louis C.K. joke that actually spoke to me. It's like whenever I wear boxers, there's always just like. A, a, like a half a cup of water just sloshing around down there. <laughs> I don't know where I don't what? know where it comes from. <laughs> like okay. a fish tank. I haven't had that issue. <laughs> uh, <Yeah. what>? like, <laughs> well, maybe you just don't know because you've got uh, you've been wearing boxers your whole life. No, no, I've switched it up. It's not like I'm ignorant to the idea of the the boxer brief world. I've I've tried. I've I've experienced all that the the vast world of men's underwear has to offer me i, I am, bet you have I, indeed i i am a i am a satisfied <laughs> boxers customer i feel like boxers are like the axe deodorant of underwear is yeah, like i kind of do too you get it when you're like 15 because you're like if somebody pants me i don't want them to know i wear briefs and then you you just grow out of it. I was That's tidy whities for a long time, man. Longer than I, I probably nice. care to admit. I was tidy whities uh, until like my freshman year of high school. Oh, was like man. I can't change in the locker room until I get boxers. <laughs> it's yeah. a transitional thing. You start at the boxer uh, or at the briefs, right? And then you yeah. eventually go to the boxers. Then you work your way to the boxer briefs, and then you're Walter White by the end. You go back to the freaking yeah, tidy whities. Yeah, it's all whities. circular. <laughs> I don't. How does I, that I, work? I, 
I don't understand why old men wear briefs. Is it just because boxer briefs <laughs> and boxers are semi-recent innovations that were not around during their formative years of becoming a man? Or is it because as you get older, maybe there's some advantage? As to you be get wearing... older, there's a lot more droopage, so you really got to do a better job of keeping things together. I think there's a reason that we don't quite know about that we'll figure out physiologically when we get to that age. <laughs> Yeah. One of us will be healthier than the rest because of what we wore. Well, I'll tell you what, you, it's like you're you're the ladies who aren't wearing bras. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And I'm the lady who's wearing a bra all the time with my boxer briefs strapped in. You're gonna are you saying briefs. your balls are going to be perkier? I'm saying my balls are going to be perkier. <laughs> oh, when you get older, you're going to need briefs to I keep all your shit. I don't want to know about Brian's <laughs> hashtag perky balls. When I get older, these <laughs> balls are going to hang like they did the day I was, well, the day I went through puberty at least. <laughs> God damn. Balls. <laughs> That's good. This is going a dangerous road. Oh, I don't want to talk. I mean, minutes. like, okay, my my alternative no, no. here for our ask roundtable was was the no, ideal. No, no, I'm not done with this. No, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> Somebody's in chat said, "Is it really more comfortable to have your shit free instead of being contained?" I think it's not, man. You know, when you go in, when you get in a race car, you put on a helmet and you pad the sides of the car. Because you don't want your head just bouncing around if you go through a turn with too many G's, right? I mean, you're like running in boxers. Your nuts are going to be doing like the Newton's Cradle shit, Look, right? I don't know you if you guys are like packing fucking Mount Your Friends style dongs in your <laughs> pants. Well, you got to wear boxer briefs just to contain that shit. I, I won't be so boastful. I've got this, this just normal size human stuff that is not... It's not giving me a hard time having to walk around like it's... If it's not if an you impedance. Go jogging, if you go jogging, aren't your testicles, like, bumping into each other all the time? <laughs> Am I going jogging? That's the first like question normal. you should ask. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind. I like the boxer briefs because it keeps everything in place. It's like a sports bra for testicles. No, nah, that's all right. I don't want it to be, like, taped up, you know? Like, I'm... I'm uh, uh, trying to hide the fact that I have a bust or something like that. Like, the briefs, sometimes... Like it doesn't it doesn't cover the whole shebang. Sometimes it does, but there's like the briefs that have like the flat leg, and then there's the briefs that have like the V triangle. Those ones is like you're asking <laughs> your legs to get stuck to your balls. But boxer briefs, man, it's easy, easy decision. Send your questions to roundtableyt at gmail dot com. Save us from uh, future. This is your degrading. fault. Man. This is a hundred percent my fault. Else no, is... I'm not. I'm not even going to try to sugarcoat that. I found, I found a question from D.D. Redding that says, what is the ideal size for a fridge magnet? Would you rather have four thumbnail size fridge magnets or one two-inch square magnet? Think of the one ways you could square. use four smaller fridge magnets to, for instance, hold an important bill onto your fridge. <laughs> All my bills are electronically oh, sent. Oh, this keeps going. I think it's a personal preference. This keeps going. Small, you guys, you guys ever have those, uh, like, word fridge magnets? Nobody uses yeah, those no, yeah, after, those. like... After two weeks, everybody's like, I'm not using these. Not even two weeks. It's like within two days of you putting them on the fridge, they're done. <laughs> you know, yep. it, it's like uh, Dark Souls uh, messages. It's like yeah. at first you're like, oh, take a look. This is an amazing view. But then at the end, like every now and then, you're just like, okay, amazing chest to hit. Yeah, be <laughs> try being pole. Try, what is it? Try... Try hitting... Try holding with both hands or something. Try being pole with both hands. Mm -hmm. There's another one It's like try... Butt jumping. fucking, but it's not butt <laughs> fucking. Oh, tongue, like, uh, tongue butthole. <laughs> tongue butthole. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> tongue butthole. Every this time. Is the language of Dark Souls, Barry. It's good. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Man. All right. Well. Destroy butthole. Yeah, that's the other one. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing chest to head. I don't think I've seen Destroy Butthole. Uh, send your questions in to roundtableyt at gmail.com. It, normally... Normally, the last couple times we've been we've been going off the rails a bit, but I promise it's a pertinent uh, uh, segment. Usually, we had some good discussion earlier. I think we could let it go a little <laughs> yeah, off the rails. We, we give ourselves a pass today. Oh, man, these are all so good. Yeah. Plunge attack butthole. Try horse butthole. <laughs> <laughs> there's horse. I don't that's know. There's horse? horse, but I don't think that's in there. Oh, Dark man. Souls, man. Out of control. All right. Time for everybody's favorite segment after their favorite segment. It's Nick's Weird Games. Every single week, Nick goes to find a weird game from his catalog of very many weird games. 
got one. Right, we're going to try to guess right, which one it is. Oh, we're not. We're, are we going to skip by the theme song this week? I was just trying to make it like super not awkward, so we didn't even have to pay any acknowledgement to it. But if you'd rather, we could do that. that. No, fair enough. Let's go. I'm ready. That's, that's Let's do it. it. All right. So today we've got an Xbox game, not an Xbox One game. Xbox original mm -hmm. with the the green X. Uh, Brute Force. Um, Fusion Frenzy. Developer is from software. Came out in 2003 in North America. And focuses on a game's protagonist named Raiko Minamoto, uh, which was based on Minamoto no Yorimitsu, uh, who was born into a clan of executioners under the Emperor's command. I don't know exactly what that means. It's a character-driven action hack-and-slash game, single-player, and scored quite favorably uh, with critics. Not Shin Megami Tensei. That's something we've talked about before, though, isn't it? No, never made it to Xbox, unfortunately. Okay. It did get one sequel this game. And I was What's published the by called? Sega. I can't give you <laughs> next two. <laughs> good, good try though. Uh, there is a soul shrine, ancestral sword. There's demons involved. I mean, this is pretty par for the course. What, yeah. what year? What year did it come out? Two thousand three. Mm -hmm. Is it? Is it Baden Kados? Nope. That's a that's a GameCube game. Is it Kabu Kabuto Citizens Shrine? You got to throw that one in there every time. I appreciate that. You <laughs> one day it. it's going to be right. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, so let me read the back, I guess. Uh, set in ancient Japan and steeped in real life folklore and mysticism, this is the story of Raiko, an undead warrior who must stop a ferocious demonic army that has been unleashed upon the earth. Literally Features fast based 3D action with deep RPG elements. You can upgrade weapons, magic, and character attributes. There are more than 25 highly destructible environments to explore and decimate. 25? And, yeah, <laughs> more than that. It could be a 3,000, if you think about <laughs> it. Uh, the most intense stylish combat available only on Xbox trademark. I don't know. I think no. that's everything I can give you without just going at it. So, Blade, Blade Storm. This is certainly a, a niche game. I'm, I'm pretty sure not everybody's going to know of this one, but the people that do know about it probably feel pretty strongly about it because it did quite well, like I said, critically, and uh, it was well-received oh, really? both this and the sequel. Um, and Shinobi. I think this is one of those games I need to actually play that I've owned for ages, even though it's quite old now. Uh, you Velvet Assassin. Now Velvet Assassin. Um, Chad has certainly gotten it a while ago. I've got to go back up and find out who got it, but you ready? Yep. Yeah, yes. I'm ready. All right. Today's game is called Otogi, Myth of Demons. Mm. Anybody hear of this? Nope, not even. The cover little. is like, it looks familiar, but doesn't mean anything. It's rated T for Teen for fantasy violence. Reminds, me of, only... reminds me of Jade Empire for some reason. Well, it is set in Japan. Yeah. Although Jade Empire was China, wasn't it? Was it? Yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was China. China. Mm -hmm. Dude, this it has the weirdest Wikipedia article. Like, the gameplay section has like a space for an essay but all it says is it boasts a number of notable features including destructible environments and an unusually high level count for a 3d action game then 20 new lines of blank space <laughs> then, in re <laughs> then in reception it says the game received favorable reviews according to video game review aggregator metacritic in japan famitsu gave it a score of 31 out of 40 20 new lines it's crazy wow uh, I'm seeing the first person that I see here that got the name is Sinozer, Sino user. But if there's someone above that that got it and it got cut off my chat, let me know because it did cut it at a certain line. So well played. Looks like there it maybe. Uh, I'm just checking out gameplay now on YouTube. Looks like it maybe has a sort of a Ninja Gaiden gameplay feel yeah. too. That's what I've heard. Mm -hmm. hmm. Cool. Well, there we go. You beat us this time. You so. got us, Nick. To be honest, I never had a chance in that one. Not yet me either. No, no I figured this yeah. was, if anyone got this, it might have been Mathis from stocking this at GameStop because it was one of the that, rather sought after ones that I remember. It might be why I recognize the cover, but I yeah. never played it. Never okay. caught my eye. Well, that is our show. I was going to do it today for Roundtable Live. Yeah, Thank you very yeah, much yeah. for joining us. Uh, apologies for the uh, video issues. Not really sure 100% what's going on today. We dropped some frames as well. But I, was hopefully... a, I was a slideshow the whole time. Yeah, which was really entertaining. Uh, <laughs> quite a few instances. 
Uh, <laughs> we want to say, of course, if you missed any part of today's show, you can check out the VOD. You can also listen to the audio-only version on iTunes. The RSS feeds should be working themselves out by now. I know that there were some Android users that were still experiencing problems. Uh, you can, by the way, in a lot of third-party Android apps, uh, again, this is... It, information for people who may not even be able to listen to the show anymore but all the same uh if you copy paste the rss feed into a lot of third-party apps you'll be able to find the podcast that way at least the new rss feed uh should be able to download the podcast that way on third-party stuff uh also you can check out the subreddit which is roundtablepodcast.reddit.com we have a twitter account at roundtable pc uh we are also uploading the vod's of course to our youtube channels uh i believe ryan you are uploading now right yeah, that's yeah. the intention, anyway. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all four of us, uh, you can check out the VOD there as well. I uh, want well, to thank our Patreon supporters, those uh, pledging at the $20 tier and up. And again, thank you guys so much, those of you that have continued to support the show over on patreon.com slash roundtable. I want to thank uh, Christopher Flagg, Jonathan Graham, Julian Abelsgard, Kevin Berkland, Matt, Alexander Spillman, General Crunk, Ignacio0891, Brizzlebrip, Positron, Justin, David Bradley, Gish van der Vett, Logan Ray, Smurfette, Super Monoman, Mediocrities, Eric Schooley, Eric Schooley, I think, and uh, Myth Scarab. Thank you guys so much for your continued support over there, and thank you very much for watching Roundtable Live today, March 25th. We'll see you in April, I guess it'll be, right? There we go. I don't know. Sure. Who yes. knows? We'll find April out. April 1st. <laughs> oh, shit. It'll be yeah. April Yeah, it'll oh, be April nice. 1st. Oh, nice. The April Fool's Day show. See you guys then. Goodbye. See you later.